Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the March 2023 Marine Fish Advisory Commission meeting, our monthly meeting. Uh, so I'm going to let Jared take a roll call here, being how it has to be recorded. And he's got the recorder on and he's typing. So, Jared. All right. Thank you. Ray Kane. Here. Bill Amaru. Here. Leo Bogdan. Present. Bill Doyle. Here. Lou Williams. Here. Mike Pierdenock. Here. Cookie Sawyer. Sookie. Here. Shelly Edmondson. Here. And Tim Brady is absent at present, but will be in attendance later. Okay. Thank you all once again for your attendance. Certainly appreciate it. And hopefully you've got blue sky and sunshine wherever you are zooming in from. Things can get funky once you get west of Boston there. So, Ron, have you got snow up there? Is it snowing up there today? No, we get uh, clouds and sunshine coming, but we still get about a, a good four to eight inches of hard packed snow that you can walk on top of. Oh, boy. Okay, now that we've got the update on weather, we'll move along to the review and approval of the February 2023 draft business meeting. Mr. Chair, do we want to um, uh, take any comments on the agenda? Yeah, by all means, I believe we're going to move five above four and, and wait on Mr. Brady's presence. Mike Pierdock, did you want to make a motion to that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to uh, flip flop those and move this, move them in the schedule. Thank you. Need a second. I'll second it. Thank you. Amaru with a second. Um, for this, we're going to have to take a roll call vote because it is a change to the um, agenda requiring a vote. So I'll call the roll again. Bill Amaru. Aye. Bill Doyle. Bill Doyle. Aye. Khalil Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Pierdenock. Yes. Sookie Sawyer. Yes. Shelly Edmondson. Yes. All right, that's approved unanimously, Mr. Chair. Then we can move along. Review, review and approval of the February draft business meeting. Has anybody edits, changes, questions? Motion to accept. Seconded by? Seconded by Shelly. Thank you, Suki. Thank you, Shelly. We'll call the roll on that. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Will Bogdan? Yes. Lou Williams? Yes. Mike Pierdenock? Yes. Sookie Sawyer? Yes. Shelly Edmondson? Yes. Motion approved. Thank you, Jared. Uh, once again, I appreciate and I want to thank each commission member for their attendance and engagement between staff, you know, offline during the month and whatnot. And, uh, you know, with the change of administrations, I understand the calendar. Jared's been working diligently on the calendar, trying to maintain meetings, move meetings. And I'll let him address that. But I want to thank everybody once again for their attendance. And hopefully, uh, whoever is on the Cape can attend the MLA, MLA trade show. I believe it starts Friday or maybe Thursday. I know I'm going to be there in presence Friday and Saturday. Suki. What day is that start? Thursday, the trade show? Uh, well, that setup day is Thursday. Friday and Saturday is the main days. Okay. Well, hopefully some commission members will be in attendance. It's, uh, you know, you get to meet the harvesters. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a good show. It's a lot of camaraderie. So I look forward to seeing some commission members there. And then I'll turn this over to Commissioner Ron Aminen. 
Good morning, Chairman Kane, and uh, good morning to all of the board members and the DMF folks. Um, happy to be here with you today. And um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Wendy and Story for doing an outstanding job of setting up the International Seafood Show down at the Convention Center in Boston. I was able to uh, attend that along with uh, Director McKinnon, and also with our brand new secretary, Rebecca Tepper, who was there for a few moments, and her, her brand new undersecretary, uh, Stephanie Cooper, as well as the new commissioner from Department of Agriculture, Ashley Randall. Uh, very well attended event. I think we were, I think the convention hall was in excess of 90% capacity, which is a huge improvement from last year. Uh, looks like it's back to its normal, normal self. Uh, looked very good. I'm currently soliciting processes and means of finding additional funding to help pay for the booth space down there. My hopes are that if uh, if the Division of Marine Fisheries, along with uh, agriculture, can fund those booths, we'll get more vendors, and uh, we're going to try to see if we can ask them all to be on the clever idea of mass ave, so we're all on one row. I think that's a great idea, and it, it, it seemed to uh, seem to be good for branding. And uh, I also, uh, Mr. Chairman, are looking forward to the MLA annual meeting and trade show down on the Cape. I will be there uh, Friday and Saturday, and uh, I do have to leave there Saturday afternoon for another banquet with the uh, Worcester County League of Sportsmen. Uh, so I, I won't make Saturday night, but I will be there Friday and Saturday. And that concludes my comments, sir. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Law enforcement, I presume this is going to be Lieutenant Bass. Is he on or who's on for law enforcement? Yes, it is, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for that. Uh, hello, everybody. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, we're continuing our efforts in the, in the bay with the whales. There are still quite a Quite a number of right whales in the bay, but it's uh, um, the amount of gear in the bay compared to previous years is um, is um, almost minimal. I think we've got just about all known gear that we know about out. Um, we are currently in the process of hiring, I think, 14. There's currently one person in the academy, but um, <clears throat> we're doing interviews as we speak, hoping to hire another 14. And uh, also looking forward to the uh, MLA convention. We'll have a couple officers there, including myself, so I um, look forward to seeing people in person. And I have uh, nothing further if there's any questions. I have, Lieutenant Bass. I have a question, Khalil. Khalil, Khalil you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt, uh, Lieutenant Bass, uh, how, how, what would that 14 bring the, the uh, full time up to if, if, they, if they all were, were to be hired? Ooh, that's, that's a good question. I might have to do some math. I'm thinking in the vicinity of the 90s, um, we are still. Um, uh, you know, some imminent retirements coming. So I'd have to kind of move the pieces around, but I'm, I'm thinking in the nineties, but I can double check on that. Thank you. At least we're making some progress as, as far as adding um, law enforcement into the field. And, and yeah, I, I, I appreciate 14, that. Yeah. 14 is probably, you know, um, about as many as we could handle to hire, you know, any one time with the training needs and equipment. Um, I, ideally there'd be another, 10 or 14 in the pipeline for next year, but I, I don't know I, if we're looking that far down the line. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Lieutenant Bass. Any other questions for Lieutenant Bass? I'm not seeing any further questions, Mr. Chair. Just a comment, Lieutenant Bass. I think, uh, you know, we have to give the lobstermen and the harvesters credit with this closure, as you stated, uh, there's very little gear in the closed area right now. So I, I think people, you know, they're in compliance. So my hat's off to them. They've realized the issues and I think they've got good leadership and I'm happy law enforcement's not out there every day looking for ghost gear or gear that's being fished anyways. We'll move along if there's no other questions for Lieutenant Bass, Director McKiernan. Thank you, good morning everyone. I'll try to limit my comments to mostly the items not on today's agenda and 
Just want to mention over the past two weeks, we've been fairly busy dealing with many issues germane to the lobster fishery. Uh, as mentioned before, the trade show is scheduled this weekend for the first time in three years, and we're really uh, looking forward to that. It's, it's always a great event. Uh, on Saturday, there's something called the Round Table, uh, which uh, it, in the past I've termed a, a dunk tank, but, um, but I, I joke because uh, it is a great way to hear from a lot of the, uh, the, the industry across all the different uh, lobster management areas, you know, out of Cape, Area 2, offshore. And it's, uh, it's, it's a great event. Uh, we usually get served up some, some uh, general topics from leadership at MLA, and we try to address those, but it can also just be kind of an open forum, which is really healthy. Um, we're also in the midst of a public comment period uh, on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission Lobster Addendum 27. Uh, this proposed rule uh, would address discrepancies in certain regulations among jurisdictions um, where within lobster management zones, but more importantly, would create a potential management program for the Gulf of Maine that would be triggered if the population were to decline below a certain threshold. So what's being debated is the threshold, as well as what action that would be taken. And that action you know, in the plan would be a, uh, a minimum size increase for, for our area one fishery um, and potential maximum size decreases for area three and the outer Cape. Uh, we held one virtual meeting last week. We're going to be engaging the industry over the weekend trade show, and we were going to hold an in-person meeting uh, next Thursday, um, a week from Thursday at the uh, Sons of Italy Hall in Quincy. Another issue that's uh, near and dear to my heart is an initiative to alter the legal landscape regarding lost and abandoned fishing gear. As you may know, gear that's washed ashore is protected from the public removing it so that the owners can retrieve it. And this made a lot of sense back in the years when traps were composed, comprised of, of wood and were always, uh, almost always intact and usable. But today's trap materials are plastic coated wire. Traps that come to shore are almost always damaged, crushed and pretty useless to the owners. And there've been a number of beach cleanup efforts that have struggled with how to deal with this trap debris that they find on the shoreline and how to interpret the statutes. And to resolve that, we've issued letters of authorization to these organizations that do beach cleanups um, by virtue of defining what we call trap debris versus intact traps. And so with that as sort of the, the foundational principle of, of what we've done in the past, studying some of the other states' marine debris laws. Um, we've, we created a task force last summer uh, led by Bob Glenn, and it included law enforcement, uh, DMF staff, folks from the Center for Coastal Studies, as well as the uh, representative uh, from the lobster industry through MLA. And um, we've, we've drafted a white paper. It's, uh, it's just, it is, it is finished essentially. It was just being reformatted and we'll present this to you at our next meeting, which will most likely be in May um, and, and, and describe the statement of the problem and also propose um, some appropriate uh, legislative fixes so that we could then kind of get involved with this at the regulatory level. Uh, and so I look forward to that. It's, it's definitely one of my priorities as director to, to see this thing get resolved. So, um, and then later in this meeting, you're going to hear about grant updates uh, from Kevin Creighton. Uh, we're handing out um, grants for buoy line replacement uh, for federal permit holders and also for vessel trackers. And so we'll be talking about that some more. So I'm going to stop there because we have a, a full agenda on so many other issues, but I can take any questions. Questions for the director. Suki. Suki, you recognize. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Ray. Thanks, Jared. Uh, just a couple of things, Dan. Thanks for uh, coming up with that meeting uh, the week after next for that for in person. There's a lot of whining about that. So thanks for doing that. And also, I don't know if Bob's on here or not, but uh, I never got to comment on his white paper. I think it was pretty detailed. And you and the staff did a really good job on it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. Questions for the director? Lou Williams? Lou, you're recognized. 
Yeah, more just a um, just a statement. Like um, I, I know that this things could be coming for the lobster industry, and I just wanted to uh, bring up something that I remember being in a meeting at the last age increase in the eighties, and there was a scientist there who said you have to be very careful how high you go up on the gauge in these inshore areas because you can get to the point where the lobsters will just migrate offshore or they get to a certain size. They don't want to uh, hang around with the shorts and stuff. And uh, I always remember that. He said, you have to be very, very careful as far as gauge increases that you could uh, have, the fit, have the lobsters just migrate offshore. So just a comment. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Lou. You. Thank you, Lou. Questions for the director? Not seeing any further questions. Well, oh, Suki? Suki, you're recognized. Nope, I was just lowering my hand. I guess uh, I'm not sure if it's up now or not. <laughs> Thank you, Suki. Well, with the uh, change in the agenda with the prior vote, we'll move to discussion items. Dan, Federal yep. Fisheries Management, I presume that's going to be Melanie. I, I hope Melanie's on with this um, slight change in the sequence. Jared, is Melanie I, with us? I am. Just oh, give good. me one second. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Morning, Melanie. Good morning. How are you? Welcome to our monthly uh, commission meeting. Hear me all right right now? Yes, we do, Melanie. Okay, great, because uh, we have pretty thin walls here uh, at the moment, so I'm trying to pop over to my AirPods. So uh, in terms of the council updates, uh, there hasn't been another New England Council meeting since you last met, but I do have a few quick updates, and thanks, Jared, for popping those slides up. Um, so yeah, I'll just give you a few updates since the January Council meeting. So next slide, please. It's okay if it needs to stay in that. It's not a big deal. There we go. Okay, so next slide. So back in December, the, the council finalized this year's scallop management priorities. And one of those priorities is an action that would consider scallop fishery access to the habitat management area on the northern edge of Georgia's bank. So that's that uh, small red, um, box uh, in, in the chart there. The council began its work and the first step is really finalizing goals and objectives for this action. And it's a it's a pretty involved action given it requires the input of two committees, Habitat and Scholes, and it'll require some coordination with groundfish as well. So on the slide, you can see the timeline for completing this first phase of work leading up to the April council meeting. The Habitat and scallop PDTs met jointly last week to provide their input for the two committees. And Habitat, I believe, meets this Thursday. And then the scallop committee meets next week on March 29th. And those should both have virtual attendance options if anyone's interested in listening into that discussion. Otherwise, I'll just keep you posted on developments as this action continues. There is a dedicated Northern Edge page on the council's website. If you go, it, it's going to live with the Habitat Committee. So if you go to the Habitat page, you'll see a quick link. There's a 2022 white paper that you may find interesting. Staff put that together. And any additional documents will just continue to be posted as the council moves through this discussion. Next slide. 
So risk policy is another management priority that's getting underway, and it's we're kind of taking a relook at the council's existing risk policy. Uh, the so-called risk policy roadmap was adop adopted in June of 2016, so it's been quite some time. And over those um, seven years, there have been a, you know, questions have arisen as the policy's consistent interpretation. And of course, we've had some changing conditions that are prompting the council to prioritize this review in 2023. The working group has been newly populated. Uh, it looks like it's going to be chaired by Megan Ware of Maine and council and SSC members from Mass are serving on that working group. And those include myself and the SSC vice chair, uh, sorry, that's the Science and Statistical Committee vice chair, Dr. Kate O'Keefe and Jonathan Peros, who um, folks will be familiar with as the main, the lead staffer for Scallop will be serving as the lead staffer for the risk policy working group. And the kickoff meeting is scheduled for April 11th. Next slide. So in terms of the Science and Statistical Committee or the SSC, I thought I'd mention a few upcoming uh, items because they do have a meeting next week on March 29th. Again, there should be a virtual attendance option if anyone wants to pop in for any of these discussions. The, ingen the agenda includes uh, the annual status report of the ecosystem. This is something we get each year. Uh, it will also involve a review of Amendment 23 performance review metrics, that's the groundfish monitoring amendment, and there will be a discussion on portfolio theory uh, with regards to ecosystem-based fisheries management, and that latter involves some research collaboration between NOAA Fisheries and SMAP led by Dr. Jason Link and Steve Cadron, and they're working with a team of collaborator, collaborators, excuse me, not haven't had my coffee yet, uh, and they're, te they're testing the practical application of this portfolio approach to different fisheries on the East Coast to gain a better understanding of whether that approach can prevent overfishing, improve sustainability, and, and increase the value of fisheries. And as the name implies, you know, like financial stock portfolios, the gist is that uh, having a diverse portfolio of fisheries management units available to a fisherman or um, you know, for access will be more stable than any one unit. It's a kind of systemic uh, wholesale treatment of all the stocks in an ecosystem rather than our current single species management approach. And in regions where it works, uh, as, as I've been mentioning, it's linked to ecosystem-based fisheries management. So the portfolio approach could facilitate that transition towards a more ecosystem-based approach. Um, next slide. Enforcement. Uh, this is a committee that hasn't met, and I apologize for the, the wordiness of this slide. That's basically their agenda for an upcoming meeting or recent meeting. But the enforcement committee hasn't met in almost a year, and so it's been newly refreshed and is uh, chaired by Pat Kelleher of Maine, and it's comprised of various law enforcement reps from Maine, Mass, uh, the Coast Guard, NOAA law enforcement, as well as two council members, Chairman Reed and Mr. Peter Whelan. Uh, the committee did just meet and they received a presentation for the NIMS gear research team on the on-demand gear and they had a, a bit of a discussion and it touched on the ropeless roadmap and stressing the importance of gear design and study and testing with fishermen. Uh, NIMS staff detailed that gear research trials in the various LMAs have been a majority of hybrid trials, some with no buoy lines, and that the trials have been expanding uh, over the years from 2019 to 2022 in terms of participation. And they're kind of taking that as documenting an increased interest in developing this gear to access vertical line closure areas. So this year they said it looks like 70 and 60 trawls will be fished experimentally in the Southern Islands and mass restricted areas respectively. Um, NIMS staff also indicated they're continuing to look for mobile gear engagement on this issue. Uh, council has continued to I give them feedback and highlight several concerns, including uh, the need for internet away from near shore Wi-Fi service areas and concern about, you know, what uh, any drift of trawls from the so-called picture that was downloaded at the start of a multi-day trip. So staff did note that they are working to encourage all the various companies to integrate their data with the Earth Ranger system, and that should allow a complete picture through the tracker app. Uh, but that's just a, a summary of what's been going on with Enforcement Committee, and I'm sure they'll be meeting more frequently in the past, given some of these issues that are popping up. Next slide. 
and this is actually probably my last slide, and I know uh, Director McKiernan will update you on the Herring Disaster Program in a bit, but I did just want to take a second to touch on another Herring issue that's proceeding outside of the council process, uh, and that is a potential challenge before the Supreme Court that argues against the industry-funded monitoring program in the herring fishery. And just to note that that program hasn't even been implemented yet. It's approved, but uh, first we had the pandemic that uh, caused some delays, and now due to a lack of funding, it's, it's just never gotten up and running. So what is perhaps more interesting is that the case is serving as a proxy and a greater argument about the longstanding Chevron doctrine or so-called Chevron deference. And I got a few flashbacks to my grad school law classes thinking about this, but Chevron is kind of a landmark case that in the 80s established a two-step test for judicial review of an agency's interpretation of its own statute. And basically that is the first step is, okay, has Congress spoken directly to the question of the issue? And if not, um, is the statute silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue? And is the agency's answer based on a permissible construction of the statute? So under Chevron step one, if Congress has spoken directly to the question at issue, then, um, then, then um, you move on to step two and the court must basically say is, if Congress's intent is unclear or if Congress is silent, the court's role is to defer to a reasonable agency interpretation. So the desirability of that doctrine basically stems from the notion that agency expertise uh, is, is a good thing and so is judicial humility. But there's been some tension between the judicial and executive branches, uh, particularly at the level of the Supreme Court with critics contending that this Chevron deference has been overly applied, preventing courts from basically independently judging questions of law. So without trying to hold a, a legal seminar on Chevron deference here, uh, I just think this is very interesting and it's a potentially impactful case, not just for the herring fishery, for rulemaking given at its court and seeking to push the question whether, um, you know, how uh, how agencies. So if you're in following the case of local right enterprises versus uh, Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce, uh, the government filed its brief just recently, and it's uh, requesting that the court reject the petitioner's um, petition to be heard or right of certiori. And if the Supreme Court does deny, then the case will not be reviewed further. But if it accepts it at this point, then basically this, this case goes on the Supreme Court docket. Uh, I think it's going into conference for the Supreme Court to decide whether it's going to take it up or not this week. Uh, so anyways, I thought it was interesting and I just wanted to highlight it for you. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Griffin. Uh, questions for Melanie? Dan? Mel yeah, Melanie, I, I have a question um, that's really interesting uh, points you bring up. When you speak about um, Congress uh, being uh, silent or, or, or weighing in on the issue, um, if if Congress has appropriated funds for for vessel tracking or for observing, does that imply that they've weighed in? Yeah, uh, that's that's a line of argument that the petitioner is saying uh, have have used saying, hey, in Magnuson, Congress has explicitly noted three time, three cases where uh, you can have monitors and charge industry, and that is. Uh, there's a specific provision for the North Pacific. There's a specific provision for foreign vessels. And then, of course, there's the, the specific provision for limited access privilege programs or LAP programs. And so um, there's arguments on both sides about whether um, that means in all other cases, it's not been expressly allowed. Uh, it's part of the argument. So I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but that is part of the, and then the the, the government NIMS's lawyers have come back and argued uh, that they have that authority uh, grossly because of their ability to uh, adopt whatever measures are needed for conservation and sustainability. But yeah, that's in, if you look at the um, the briefs on either side, it, it's interesting to, to read through the reasoning about that. All right, thanks. Yeah. Questions for Melanie? Okay. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jared Ray. Uh, Melanie, 
going back to the first uh, slide about scallops and uh, opening up the area on northern uh, Georgia's banks, was the uh, trap fisheries been any discussions about that? Because I'm pretty sure guys fish up that way and they're going to open it up where it has never been opened before. I think they should be in included in some kind of conversation. Absolutely. I mean, the offshore lobster fishery, well aware that that's operating out there. And I mean, you you know, there have been agreements for other areas. Um, I think this is just the first step of it really lives with the habitat committee right now. And then it, it's kind of shades of how we had to deal with uh, OHA2 access for the clam dredge fishery. So there's kind of back and forth right now just related to the habitat, but we're well aware of all the different uh, gears and fishery, be it ground fish or lobster. And um, that, so we're, we're gonna try, I mean, we don't have a lobster committee, right? But uh, I, I know the council will, is well aware of that and we'll, we will seek to make sure that those fisheries and fishermen are engaged. Okay, great. Thanks for that, I was just wondering. Thank you, Suki. Uh, if I may segue on that, Melody, Years ago, I believe when Bill Adler was still on the commission, being how the commission is in charge of uh, lobster management plans, I believe there was a gentleman's agreement because my numbers might be wrong. This is all recollection on my part, but like 70 or 75 percent of the lobsters on the northern edge between the months of June and October, I believe, that transient that area are egg bearing lobsters. And as you well know, because you work with Dan and the council should be aware of, uh, you know, lobster denim 27. Is my recollection wrong? Was there a gentleman's agreement? Yeah, that's what I was trying to refer to there. Like that closed area too, there's seasonal closures when uh, during that sensitive period in the summertime for lobsters. And hopefully that would be we would want to see like a ground up agreement, but um, it's something that the council certainly has to foster. So would you suggest then that we as commission members or being active on the commission listen in on these? Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, and, and the dates will be posted so I can put it on my calendar? Yes, I will make sure that uh, as these meetings are scheduled, like I said, the the habitat committee meets first and that's this week on Thursday and then next week the scout committee meets on March 29th and I will follow up with Jared to make sure that you get links to both of those meetings. Thank you very much I appreciate that. You're Questions for Melanie. Dan did you want to jump in and comment on that? Well no if Melanie's with, done with her um, comments uh, I'll, I'll let Mike Peard not go because I just want to make the last comment on this section about council appointments. So why don't we go to Mike? Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, I, I have been participating in uh, ongoing meetings uh, to address climate change, shifting stocks, proposed change in management of how uh, we address uh, climate change and shifting stocks. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service has had, uh, we had our, our third meeting most recently, a few weeks ago, um, uh, down in uh, DC, um, where, in which Nicola was attending. There's representation at these meetings from each regional council from the North New England all the way down to the Gulf as well as the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission. Um, and at the most recent meeting, uh, there was discussions and consensus of how to uh, move forward to try to address, for example, uh, stocks that are managed by the Mid-Atlantic, yet those stocks have shifted up into our waters and uh, how that would be addressed. Because as we know, we, we don't have any votes at the Mid-Atlantic Commission and uh, how what, how then could that be dealt with now or in the future? And then there was uh, discussion concerning how liaisons are involved and what truly their authorities are from each council as they sit in um, on different council meetings. Uh, what I, I wanted to note with that is, is that uh, from what I understand, I believe, Melanie, there's an NRCC meeting in May 9th and 10th uh, that I, I I need some confirmation whether this is or is not the case, where they're going to discuss uh, first 
these proposed management changes uh, and then whether they would proceed with uh, addressing them uh, in 2024. Other thing I'd like to note is that there was consensus around the table that there be developed as all or many on this call know there's a commercial research fleet, but let's develop a recreational research fleet. That's the approach A. Then approach B is let's take the four higher fleet and have them uh, participate, and this is all through cooperative research, and have them participate in cooperative research and provide data and details and information that can be used for fishery management purposes. And then the third thing was to how to then do that recreationally, uh, independent of the four hire, uh, where there was discussion. So, um, Melanie, can you confirm, is that on the docket uh, well, two things. Is that on the discussion for your discussion in the executive committee coming up? Well, uh, uh, my understanding is it's, it's supposed to be discussed May 9th and 10th. Can can you confirm if that is or is not the case? Uh, I can confirm the NRCC dates, May 9th and 10th in Gloucester. There's not an agenda for that yet. And um, I need to look at the draft agenda I've gotten for the XCOM because I don't recall off the top of my head. So if you give me a second, I can uh, throw it in the chat box. Sure. I just, um, from what I recall, that that was the process. Um, and I just want to make sure that keeps moving forward and, and gets addressed accordingly. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Questions for Valerie? Dan, you're recognized. No, well, Ray, I just want to mention um, under this heading of um, federal update uh, in the governor's letter that went for the New England Council's uh, uh, nominations for the two vacant seats, uh, John Papalardo was nominated to um, serve uh, another term, and Jackie O'Dell was nominated to uh, serve in the um, in the in the seat being vacated by. Uh, Libby Etri, and then we're, we had two other candidates that are also uh, listed as second and third choices, but I just wanted to let the commission know uh, what the who the first choices were for those seats. And that goes to the Secretary of Commerce, and uh, we usually hear in June what the final decisions are. Thank you, Dan. Any other questions for Melanie? Nicola? Uh, Nicola, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to um, agree with um, Mr. Pierdock that the the takeaway message from um, that climate change summit was that part of it was that NOAA leadership did say that they would be bringing that new uh, draft guidance document to the NRCC in May, and it's it's guidance that looks at when the secretary would review and potentially reassign the authority of stock management across jurisdictions when it, what kind, kind of criteria might be used, what kind of triggers. Um, and so the, I, and the, what was stated was that um, after bringing that forward to the NRCC in May, that the goal would be to have that adopted and in place for 2024, so that there would just be guidance in place for when the secretary would um, review the jurisdiction of councils. Thank you, Nicola. Questions? Not seeing any further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Melody. Another excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Moving along, protected species management updates. And who's going to cover this? Bob Glenn. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Jared, are you, do you want me to share my screen or are you going to bring it up? I got it, Bob. Just give me a second. Sure thing. So Bob, we'll see you at the MLA trade show. Absolutely. Yep. I'll be there Friday and Saturday. Very good. Thank you. Actually, Jared, let me, uh, I added, an, I just added an additional slide. So, um, want me to share? <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of that. 
Go right ahead. Sorry about that. Apologies all for the uh, delay. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, very quickly, I just want to kind of four topics to quickly go over. One is an update on our incidental take permit application, uh, an update on our gear hauling and closure enforcement work this, this season. And then the last two items relate to, to two different uh, proposals to the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, one submitted by DMF relative to delisting humpbacks. And then I wanted to bring you the commission up to speed on another petition uh, proposed by the Southeast Massachusetts Pine Barrens Alliance to list horseshoe crabs as a species of special concern. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm doing it, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so good news is that um, we initially uh, submitted our, our first draft for our conservation plan uh, back in July. We got initially great feedback uh, from it, uh, made some corrections and updates to it based on guidance from NOAA Fisheries. And then um, after December, with the, the omnibus spending bill came out and there was you know, some debate over whether or not uh, what the next steps moving forward were because of the, the hiatus that Congress put on large whale take reduction plans. We uh, consulted both um, our department legal counsel as well as the attorney general's office um, and for, through their guidance as well as our insight, you know, decided that re, despite that uh, Congress's uh, changes in from the um, the omnibus spending bill, that it was still in DMF's best best interest. So we to submit that. So we submitted our updated draft, which we hope is our, our you know a near final product to NOAA Fisheries back in February. Um, and at this point, we expect this to move forward through uh, no review and and a NEPA analysis. Uh, over the coming year, uh, and so um, we're, we're at this point where uh, we're expecting it to um, hopefully get additional positive feedback and not have many more changes we need to make to this. But we're hoping that the permit's going to be successful, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll post you with any um, updates as they come become available. Um, the next thing is our gear retrieval program. This is the second year we've conducted this. Uh, it's a very, very successful partnership between um, Mass DMF, the Mass Environmental Police, and also several commercial lobster fishers who, who work with us. Um, the highlights for this year is we had five commercial vessels participate. We completed a total of, of 13 sea days. We hauled out 368 traps approximately and, and over 208 buoy lines. And so this is dramatically less than in last year. Uh, last year, we had seven vessels working on 49 sea days with over 2,000 traps and over 500 buoy lines. So it's a really dramatic um, increase in compliance with the closure in general, and then also in compliance with uh, all the, the rope marking and, and weak insert rules. Uh, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, you know, the fishing industry really responded. And also, I think, um, you know, just uh, us getting out and, and doing this work and monitoring as well as some of the um, uh, enforcement cases that were brought forth last year has, has really assisted and, and, and made this, this, you know, compliance with the closure really take off. Um, and to, just for a comparison, you can see these, these are two maps side by side. One was from February 6th of 2022 on the left, and that's the first time. And so these are aerial surveillance. Uh, when, I, when the plane flies on these tracks, we can also have them marked down, you know, for looking for whales. They also can mark down the location of any buoys that they find. Um, and these maps are pretty instrumental in helping us both locate where the gear is, and then also kind of monitoring compliance overall with the closure. So in, in 2022, you can see the, the first day the plane flew after the start of the closure was February 6th. And we have a fair amount of gear throughout Mass Bay and off of Cape Ann um, and, and other locations. 
And on the right is what it looked like the day the closure started on February 1st of 2023. So really just a small smattering of gear compared to the previous years. And then once our cleanup efforts kind of wrap up, then we fly additional surveillance and that's these two maps. Um, and then so you can see clearly the effect of the gear removal process and you know from the start of uh, in February of 22 now to April, you can see the state waters is, is completely cleaned out. And then on the right, we have the similar map for this year. And so the, the plane pl flew on March 10th and you can see by and large state waters is empty is that there were a couple of buoys spotted by the plane uh, this one just south of Cape Ann here was actually hauled out um, the day the plane flew. We had a boat on, on its way out. They got that. And so, you know, we're really confident and really uh, that, you know, the, the closure is one, compliance is high, two, uh, that it's effective and that getting buoy lines out of the way of large whales. And so it's gone very well. And a big thank you to Mass Environmental Police. Um, and, the, and the, the fishermen we work with to get this effort completed. And then a lot, you know, one final wrap up slide here. One thing that we're finding for the, 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 the few gear that we do find, it's mostly uh, just lost. It, a lot of it is a lot of the commercial gear. It's just a trawl or two here and there or a single that was lost by one of the fishers. Um, overall, we're seeing around a 97% compliance rate with, with weak inserts and with gear marking which is excellent um better than we you know, better than last year and better than i honestly could have anticipated that's just that's you know really good work by the fishing industry to to take the 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 gravity of the of the right wheel situation and our regulations to protect them uh seriously so it's great um what we also saw a lot of what we've primarily found this year were primarily single traps and this was a, a mix of recreational traps and for lack of a better term, I would just call them kind of, you know, pirate traps or poachers traps. And I, I can't really classify them necessary as as uh, recreational fishers because this is gear where the buoy nor the trap has any identifying features. Um, there's no numbers, no permit numbers on it whatsoever. Uh, we found one individual is pretty interesting that. Uh, he had a red solo cup inside of every single trap. This was up in Boston Harbor. Um, and no other identifying features to it at all. No buoy, uh, no buoy marks, no, no marks in the traps whatsoever. And there was 40 of his traps. And he also had some really strange buoy lines with, with big pieces of chain on them, et cetera. And so, um, you know, th this isn't a commercial fisherman. This isn't a recreational. This is just someone who is, you know, clearly violating the law. And it's, it's our hope that uh, we can at some point catch up with this individual. But anyways, very successful program. Um, and so another update was back on March 3rd, um, we, Division of Marine Fisheries submitted a proposal to the Mass Endangered, uh, to the Mass Massachusetts Wildlife Fisheries and Wildlife Division's um, Natural Heritage Program. Uh, to delist humpbacks under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. Um, we did this to just to make, uh, you know, the state um, listing consistent with federal listing. Uh, NOAA Fisheries has delisted humpbacks back in 2016. And based on their population assessments, they determined that the, the West Indies distinct population segment is, is not at risk of extin extinction. And that's the, the population segment, a portion of the population that we have in mass waters. And that, that stock ranges essentially from the Caribbean where it winters um, all the way up to Atlantic Canada. And, you know, it's one of our most common whales that we see here throughout the summer. Um, currently for, for humpback whales, uh, mortality, anthropogenic mortality through entanglement and ship strikes are all below PBR. Um, the stock continues to grow at a, at a, at a reasonable rate. Um, and overall, um, the this you know NOAA's uh, SRG, their their stock assessment group have found that the high abundance of, of humpback whales provides sufficient resilience to anthropogenic mortality, and so we submitted that to Mass Wildlife, and um, that's currently under review. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, um, the Southeastern Massachusetts Pine Barren oh, Pine Barrens Alliance submitted a proposal to the Division of Fish and Wildlife's Natural Heritage Program to list horseshoe crabs as a species of concern. 
Um, a species of special concern is defined by Mass Wildlife uh, in, in, that their director will list a species of special concern to any species of plant or animal which has been documented by biological research and inventory to have suffered a decline that could threaten the species if allowed to continue unchecked or that it occurs in such small numbers or such a restricted distribution or special has specialized habitat requirements that it could easily become threatened within Massachusetts. Um, the proponents claim that commercial harvest interrupts breeding activity and threatens sustainability, um, that horseshoe crabs are mismanaged and that horseshoe crabs, they claim that play an essential role in ecosystem, that the role that they play is threatened in that and primarily citing that uh, the eggs from horseshoe crabs provide, provide an important food source for several species of um, migratory birds as well as marine fish. Um, DMS staff is conducting an internal review of this on our own. Uh, we hope to consult with Mass Wildlife at a later date. Um, at first glance, uh, obviously DMF does not agree with the proponent's claim. Uh, the data that DMF has from both our spawning beach surveys as well as our trawl survey indices show positive population trends over the last decade that appear to be subsequent to the implementation of our spawning beach closures. So it's, it's our opinion that those have been effective um, at, at incre increasing horseshoe crab um, recruitment. And we, we've, we've seen that signal in our population surveys so the trawl survey and beach spawning surveys. Uh, and so um, in addition to that, we also believe that the new regulations we recently proposed that are under consideration uh, will add some additional pr protections and further promote sustainability. So, um, I'll, you know, I'll keep the commission informed as this this progresses, but I, I just wanted to uh, get this on your radar screen. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Questions for Bob Glenn. Bill Amaro, have you got questions? Uh, actually, I don't. I have a comment. I, I have a comment to make. Then by all means, go, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. You can comment, Bill. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, well, I, I agree with this last issue that was brought forward that this is a species of special concern, but for a completely different set of reasons than the uh, the individuals who brought the, the topic forward. Um, frankly, it doesn't meet any of the criteria that the state has set up for that particular species. As Bob's just done a good job of outlining the populations increasing, not decreasing. Um, it, it's an important species because of its value to the world community in terms of its health benefits. And that's why the state is being aggressive about controls and putting in additional restrictions that are going to make sure that the, re the resource remains as viable and, and populous as it is. So I'm in complete agreement with the state's position on this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Questions for Bob Glenn? Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, regarding the last issue with the horseshoe crabs, um, Bill brings up some important points. But also, uh, if, if there is an organization or a group of people that feel that uh, this issue needs to be looked at, uh, I think that we need to respect that request and to let that process play out. Um, I have uh, special concerns regarding the horseshoe crab. You know, it's a living fossil, and and uh, we want the best for what for humanity and what the horseshoe crab does for that. Uh, but also, we want to make sure that uh, the horseshoe crabs are are managed in a way that they're you know they're sustainable and uh, that the population remains healthy and that there's a benefit to both mankind and to the animal. So I, I just want to, I agree with uh, Bill Amaru on that, but I also want to say that we need to let this thing play out and not make any preconceived judgments uh, regarding um, the, the reason for the, for the um, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. I'll just comment on your statement. I believe that uh, the task that DMF has before them, and they've been very engaged in this. We all want both harvesters and the ecosystem to benefit. So thank you for your comments. Any thank other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for Bob Glenn? 
Not seeing any other questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, then we can move along. Update on grant programs for gear marking, vessel trackers, resiliency, and Atlantic current disaster relief. Who's got this, Dan? Ray, I'll um, open it up and I'll ask staff to, um, to because we have different staff working on these various uh, grants. Right. And there's four grants, um, as mentioned in the agenda. The first is for gear marking. And the origin of this was in last year's um, state budget. There was an earmark to the DMF budget of a half million dollars to assist uh, commercial lobstermen to um, deal with the new regulations pertaining to the uh, uh, large rail take reduction plan. And if you recall, uh, we went through two uh, iterations of rulemaking regarding buoy marking. And at the 11th hour, we came up with kind of a, a new derivation where we, we realized that if um, if there are dual permit holders, um, when they're fishing in the federal zone, didn't um, properly mark that gear as in the federal zone, it could really come back to haunt us because when NOAA fisheries did their biological opinion, they only covered the federal fisheries. And our new incidental take permit applications is only for the state fisheries. So if there is an entanglement um, that happens in Massachusetts gear and it happens in the EEZ and in in gear, we, we want to be able to um, delineate that as opposed to that same fisherman's gear fishing in the in the state waters portion. So um, we got some negative feedback from the industry uh, about you know this being very expensive, very impractical to to be um, remarking buoy lines at sea. And some of the participating lobstermen suggested that would just uh, prefer to go out and buy a second set of buoy lines for when they want to move that gear over the line. And so um, the, the state legislature has given us uh, that those funds to do that. And so we are in the process now of, of um, determining eligibility to, um, to divide up that half million by the, uh, the a number of eligible participants. Um, and I believe uh, Kevin and Story and Anna Webb's team have been working on that. Um, uh, Kevin, a story, Ariana, do you want to weigh in as to the where we are in terms of eligibility and the expected payments for that grant? Can you hear me okay? Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, um, yeah so that was a good summary, Dan. Thanks for that. Um, we are, um, we have reached out to the industry and uh, I'm We're having an issue with your audio, Kevin. Sorry, I don't know what it is with Zoom calls. Hold on a second. Ray, is that any better? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was on the Teams call, and whenever I switch these state computers to Zoom, my audio kicks out. Uh, anyway, uh, we mailed out applications to all potential uh, coastal lobster, offshore lobster guys. Um, back in February, and that closes April 1st for anybody to submit uh, an application for the relief funding. Uh, it's by, uh, by law, it's capped at $5,000 per um, eligible fisherman. I'm guessing based on the number of folks that have applied, it's gonna be probably close to 3,500, maybe $4,000 a piece um, to help uh, cover the cost of the additional gear they need. And we've actually partnered with um, with MLA to help distribute those funds. It's much more efficient for us instead of trying to get you know 120 lobstermen in the state's accounting system. Um, we partnered with MLA, and they're going to help us cut those checks. And I expect uh, there's no reason why that um, those funds won't be out the door by May. So anyway, it closes uh, at the end of next week. Uh, we'll do our final evaluation, uh, deal with any appeals, um, and then provide a list. Uh, to MLA and those checks will boil. So that's where we're at on the gear marking, uh, $500,000 earmark. So let me keep going with trackers, Dan. Yeah, I'll give a quick intro on trackers. Recall that sure. the ASMFC approved an addendum uh, a year ago to require federal lobster vessels, federally permitted lobster vessels to um, install trackers that would uh, provide um, a VMS vessel monitoring system uh, like uh, a data set for each vessel. And, um, but it's, this is uh, 
cellular base. It's not satellite based, so it's substantially less expensive. And there was some misgivings about it, but then um, through some work with the main congressional delegation and the mass congressional delegation, some funds were added to some existing um, grants that were going to ASMFC for marine mammals. And we wound up getting an extra 4 million uh, for this particular project. So uh, we're, we're able to um, give each eligible vessel uh, about a $1,500 award, which is going to give uh, them the, the enough money to cover the unit and uh, many years of service, anywhere between three and four years of, of, of cellular service. Um, our regulation requires these devices be installed by uh, May 1st. And we're hopeful that this upcoming trade show, there's a lot of transactions that are going to go down where people are going to, um, you know, buy the units and then come to us for uh, reimbursement. Um, Kevin, do you want to add anything? Uh, Jared's texting me that my my audio is still pretty garbled. Uh, I think you have it. I'm going to try and get on my phone. Okay. All right. Um, I see Lou's hands up and Sookie's as well. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, I'm in the process, just just my own scenario of putting my uh, scholar permit back on the boat for April 1st. And um, my federal lobster permit is attached to that, so it'll be going on the boat too. So having that permit on, I'll be running a regular VMS. Will I still have to get one of these lobster VMSs or was with the scholar permit, I have to run it year round? Do you have a lobster permit that allows you to fish traps in the EZ? Uh, this permit going on my boat uh, has my lobster permit attached to it, so it will be back on the boat. And it allows you to fish traps as yep. opposed to non-trap? Yep. Yeah, so um, I, I believe you will still have to have it on there because our data is going to be more precise than the VMS. I think the, the VMS being satellite, the number of hits is going to be... Um, you know, fewer than what this device is going to do. And um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if Story wants to, to speak to that or Anna. Yeah, Dan, that, that's accurate. So yes, Lou, you would have to get this additional um, device. And you bring up a good point. Um, the mailing went out on Friday to who we thought were the um, impacted permit holders. There's a chance you weren't included in that if your permit was in CPH. So um, we'll have to look into that. And obviously you'd be put in the queue for um, reimbursement as well. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, just another quick question on it is, um, so when this one, is this going to be like the other VMS and you have to have power to it 24 seven? Yes, it's lower powered. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we can get you the specs on it. I think the the power burden is is much less than the VMS. Yeah, because like I said, I, now I'm going to be running two VMSs. Sure. You know, which is... <laughs> sure. Yeah, we'll okay. get you the specs on it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Lou. It's okay. Yep, thanks. Uh, Dan, I... Uh... From my understanding, I don't have a federal permit, but from just talking to guys down the dock that uh, there's only two companies available this year. And do they have enough units to uh, keep feed everybody's needs before May 1st? I'm going to ask Story to um, respond. Yeah, the vendors, those two vendors that have been approved, there's actually a third, but they haven't um, provided the ordering information yet for us. Um, so at any rate, these two vendors have assured us they have enough units. Um, Massachusetts has a bit of an advantage in that we're the first state to roll this out. So um, hopefully our fishermen can get in line first and get those devices. Okay, and there, is, is there a, what are they have supposed to buy? They're supposed to buy these directly from the company? That's right. The companies set it up so uh, they could buy it directly from the company. But that having been said, we are starting to get questions from um, electronics vendors like Seatronics here in Gloucester, and they actually want to have a conversation with somebody from our staff today just so they understand the program. 
Yeah, I've been talking to Bob. I've been talking to them over there about this, and uh, they hadn't had yep. any contact. I figured the vendors would have contacted a couple of these electronics dealers, but obviously it hasn't happened. I just didn't know how how difficult it was to install, and if guys wanted to pay, uh, you know, somebody similar to Ctronics to install, if that would, you know, screw up the uh, the money part of it all as far as uh, the program. Uh, the, the plan to have you know three years worth of data collected that's all right so we'll talk to Citronics today okay thanks for that hey, yep. story do you want to mention that we we upped the awards to 1500 expecting that could cover the in installation in addition to the unit in, in three years of service that's right we hope that it could and the two vendors are offering um, slightly different pricing obviously that's up to them um, one of them is offering differing lengths of um, a service plan up front. So, it's, you know, maybe you, you buy four years of a service plan and you still have a couple hundred dollars, three hundred dollars for the install cost. So um, there's just some decisions that have to be made by the individual permit holder. OK, thanks. Yep. OK, um, the resiliency uh, grants. Um, Story, do you want to tackle that, you or Kevin? Or, although Kevin's kind of muted, but um, talk about the resiliency awards that we've been working on. Sure, I can take that. Kevin, are you back? Or I can, happy to start. Um, so the resiliency grants, um, this environmental economic innovation grant, um, the application deadline was actually in the late fall. Um, and we've received, um, I believe, over 30 applications for that and reviewed those. Um, and right now, we're kind of going through the final review process and the process that we have to go through within the department um, to get those awards approved. So um, applicants should be finding out very soon, I would say within the next two to three weeks. And those awards were for up to $100,000 for um, a variety of, of different projects from um, different marketing initiatives, um, innovative approaches to um, to just any different kind of thing having to do with the seafood industry, commercial um, harvesters to dealers applied um, to different nonprofit groups. So there's a real variety of projects that were reviewed by our staff. Okay. And then um... The last um, grant topic has to do with uh, Atlantic Herring Disaster Relief. Um, our governor, our Governor Baker, submitted a letter, I think it was almost three years ago, um, seeking uh, disaster declaration uh, as uh, because of the, um, the dramatic decline in the herring quotas. Um, and um, this money is expected to finally come through around April 1st. We put together a spending plan um, in in uh, coordination with some of the other states, although each state has its had its own plan, and ours is going to allocate uh, sixty percent to harvesters, forty percent to dealers uh, that would be primary buyers in the Commonwealth, and uh, have, there's a, a minimum amount of payment that um, that uh, any award would have to meet a certain threshold. I, 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 maybe it was around ten thousand dollars. I don't remember exactly, but. The, the point is, um, these these awards are going to be, um, for the most part, pretty substantial because the herring fishery is is not a um, is not a, a fishery where people take a few fish or you know it's you're you're either all in or not. It's these are these are directed uh, harvesters, uh, midwater trawlers here, uh, mostly um, per saners um, up north, and um, and so we hope to get that money onto the in, onto the streets. Um, sometime in um, by April or May or late April, early May, so we can uh, uh, satisfy those unmet needs, uh, especially in the ports of Gloucester and New Bedford, where the, a lot of that fleet resides. I can take any questions on that, but um, that's just a brief overview. And Dan, I just want to add that Kevin's staff has put together a really nice um, Web page on mm -hmm. our site that summarizes all of these different programs. It's a good place to go for that type of information. We've we've never had 
all this information kind of in one place. So that's a, a big. You want to throw that into the chat story? I will. Yep. Okay. All right, Ray. If there's no other questions, we can move on to um, a brief summary of the shellfish advis advisory. If there are no other questions for Dan and his staff, let's move along to the shellfish advisory panel meeting summary. Yeah, so um, commission will recall that um, this was a, a new uh, panel that was created when the um, Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative Strategic Plan was established. Uh, Bill Doyle is our representative from the commission onto the shellfish advisory panel, but it's a, it's a team that includes uh, other agencies it includes uh, constables. It also includes um, uh, members of the, of the industry as well and some recreational harvesters. Uh, we, we had a meeting. We basically worked on, uh, on four key issues, uh, bulk tagging. Bulk tagging is an interesting question because all shellfish harvesters are required to, to put a label uh, or, or an official tag designating, you know, the, the, the growing area, the permit number, the time of harvest, all that on every container or every bag. And sometimes that can be uh, considered by some to be burdensome, especially as uh, when those, those containers of shellfish are sold to a dealer and then those those uh, have to be retagged by the dealer so there are some especially among the aquaculture uh, industry that want us to relax that standard um, we already do allow the grower dealers to what we call bulk tag you know to put just a tag on on a, on a larger container let's so you let's say you had a large plastic tote uh, filled with with bags of oysters by just labeling the outside of that uh, would be a would be acceptable, especially because in essence, they're selling those those bags of shellfish to themselves because they are quote unquote grower dealers. Um, but we've, we've been trying to determine if it would be appropriate to relax that and allow other growers who aren't dealers to, to do that. And frankly, we haven't had um, a lot of um, um, uh, embracing of this by many of the dealers. And um, what, what I see is it's really shifting a, an administrative burden from one sector to the, to the other. So we're going to continue to work on this one, but I do have some misgivings about that request. Uh, the second issue we talked about was just the biennial, biennial meeting proposals. Uh, the, the shellfish program is largely um, overseen by the what's called the model ordinance, which is an agreement between the FDA and the states, and the states are organized by what's called the ISSC, um, which is analogous to the ASMFC. Uh, my shellfish team, four of them are heading down to a meeting in Louisiana, uh, I think it's this week or next week, and um, they're going to be in, in many committee meetings and making, you know, many uh, possible changes to that model ordinance. It's the first time that group will have met in a few years. And, uh, and that's where the rubber meets the road for a lot of these changes. And, um, and we went over a lot of those potential changes. It's a little bit in the weeds, but I think that is one of the most important things this, this shellfish advisory panel can do for us is to provide you know, an, a, you know, a, a sounding board or, or an ability to hear from the industry to comment on, on what we think um, should be pursued or how we should vote on some of those issues, much like an ASMFC, uh, you know, vote where, where you as a, as a group of individuals can advise uh, me and, and, and Ray and, and, and Sarah Peak on, on uh, certain votes that might be taken at the regional level. The next issue is a surf clam management update. And I'll confess, this is a very vexing problem for me. There is a case law going back to 2015 um, and, and then in 2017, where the Wetlands Protection Act uh, has been determined by a, a judge and appeals court to have some standing in the regulation of some fishing activities known as dredging. And, um, and so we are diligently trying to uh, resolve that and maybe, maybe come up with some, <clears throat> some different, uh, different rules in the future. And I'm working um, sometimes not so patiently with my uh, sister agency, the Department of Environmental Protection and our respective attorneys to try to come up with some solutions there. Meanwhile, we have some commercial harvesters who would like to see some, some changes or would like to see some, some progress on this and they're watching us very closely. But for now, uh, we do have one town that is the town of Provincetown where, um, where they have some some 
regulations or some expectation that uh, dredging within their town waters, dredging for shellfish, um, not only falls under the marine fishery statutes, but under the Wetlands Protection Act, and, and they feel they have um, some uh, measure of control over that through the, the Department of Environmental Protection's uh, statutes. So it is a work in progress. And if, if I told you that um, dealing with marine debris was a, was a top priority, I'd be honest with you, this one's even, uh, even above that. This has been uh, weighing on me pretty heavily over the last um, eight years since this came down and I would love to, love to see this resolved. Then the last thing is uh, municipal aquaculture license site transfers. This was an issue that came up about five years ago when the Mass Aquaculture Association filed a bill to um, have the legislature amend one of the statutes that would allow um, some of the aquaculturists uh, a little bit more leniency in terms of, of finding buyers for their, for their businesses and, and maybe a potential transfer of their site license to a buyer. And this became almost the third rail issue where um, some of the uh, municipalities uh, wanted to maintain the control that they have under this current statute, the, uh, the, any other site licenses uh, that are granted to aquaculturists go back to the municipality for, for their issuance. And some of the growers uh, would like to have a little bit more control over those. So we're going to endeavor to do some surveys of the various municipalities to see how they deal with uh, these transfers and how they, um, how you know, how they, what their policies are, what their practices are about about um, issuing permits uh, and and reissuing permits. So it's going to be an interesting discussion, and it's one that a lot of in the in the uh, aquaculture industry uh, is looking forward to. This wouldn't be any recommendations necessarily; it would just be a comparison and contrasting of the vis different municipalities and how they deal with this um, this issue. There is home rule for for um, shellfish, and this is a this is an issue that there are many, uh, many of our stakeholders um, are, do not want us to necessarily alter the, the statutes or, or even uh, or anybody to alter those statutes. But I think it's worthy of doing the study to, to so people can understand that. So that's a quick update, Ray, on shellfish advisory panel issues. We're going to be meeting again at the end of April and resume some conversations on some of these issues. Uh, another issue that did come up that we hope to cover at the next meeting is a perceived shortage of shellfish seed uh, throughout the region. And we're wondering um, you know, how we could help with that. And so um, among some other topics, but I'll, I'll stop there if there are any questions. Questions for the director. Not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, commission members, we can move along. Anticipated public hearings and Marine Fish Advisory Commission meeting schedule. Jared. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, recall back at the February meeting, we submitted uh, for your review several uh, public hearing proposals um, affecting commercial fisheries management, uh, dealing with summer flounder, menhaden, and uh, horseshoe crabs principally. Uh, I had initially anticipated we would be going out to public hearing in the next uh, week or so and coming back to the commission at the April 11th business meeting with, a, um, with final recommendations for implementation in early May. Um, that timeline has been uh, delayed a bit with the new incoming administration. The uh, reg review process is uh, a bit slower than it, it, it has been, which is not uncommon uh, with new administrations as they work to get uh, the rank and file staffed. Um, we're starting to see a lot of that staffing um, come into place at the end of February. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get a public hearing notice filed uh, by the end of the month um, on these items. That will bring us to having late April public hearings um, and likely bringing final recommendations to the commission at the May meeting. Uh, given that timing, uh, you know, 
internally, we're going to have to consider potential alternatives um, to some of these measures to have them in place by June 1, if we want them in place by June 1, such as, um, you know, in-season adjustments or, or some other, um, you know, action like that or potentially delaying rulemaking for certain actions until 2024 or proceeding with these actions in season. Um, but then we'll, we'll have a better handle on that by the time we come back with our recommendations in May. Um, with that in mind, that's going to kind of adjust the MFAC meeting schedule moving forward. We had an April 11th meeting schedule that was going to be principally uh, held principally to review and vote on these public hearing measures. As we won't be able to go out for public hearing by then, I talked to Chairman Kane about canceling that meeting um, and instead holding a virtual permitting subcommittee meeting um, at that date and time. So the folks on that permitting subcommittee will uh, receive um, some information either from Story Reader or myself uh, regarding um, an agenda. So if you're on that permitting subcommittee, hold the um, April um, 11th at 9 a.m. time slot, and we'll have a, uh, a uh, second permitting subcommittee meeting uh, at that point. And we'll report back to the full commission at the May meeting on that. Then um, public hearings at the end of April, hopefully, presuming we get approval to file that notice by the end of the month. Um, then the May 16th meeting we had scheduled to have on the vineyard. Um, as we're going to be discussing, uh, likely discussing a number of those commercial fisheries management uh, items, we're thinking about moving that meeting off the island to a uh, mainland location. So it's more central for the individuals who participate in those fisheries to attend. Um, I haven't determined that location yet, but likely either going to be uh, DMF's New Bedford office or DFW's Westboro office, depending on availability. Then I will move to schedule a June meeting, uh, which we will hold on the vineyard uh, mid-June to, uh, and that will probably deal with finalizing the emergency regulations to adjust recreational fishing limits uh, that we're gonna discuss coming up next. And to, um, and we'll, we'll develop a couple island specific our, or island adjacent uh, agenda items to discuss at that meeting. So that's what it's looking like moving forward. I just wanted to let everyone know that there's been some delays uh, getting out to public hearing this spring and that we're going to jostle around the um, business meeting schedule based on that. Thank you very much, Jared. Questions for Jared? Does everybody have an understanding of the issue and what Jared's trying to accomplish? Not seeing any questions, Mr. Chair. We can move on to. Uh, okay, if we're going to move on, on, we've got a little time here. So let's take a 10 minute break and come back at uh, 10 03. This meeting is now in session. So we're gonna move along now to upcoming emergency rulemaking for recreational fisheries. Dan. Yep. Okay, thank you, Ray. So first, uh, just to 
description of process, if I could. Um, this commission under 17A uh, normally approves uh, director's proposals um, after public hearing and they go through rulemaking and they become and their final rules, um, you know, after you guys, uh, you know, approve them, uh, they go through a brief process with the administration. Um, however, um, every year we do this, uh, which is a more of a uh, slightly more chaotic uh, process because we don't have time, uh, sufficient time to vent the uh, proposals since we don't get these data um, until late winter, um, I'm sorry, early winter. And by the time uh, Nicola works with the other states and, and with um, the, the Mid-Atlantic Council and possible options, we wind up with this fairly abbreviated process. <clears throat> so what we do is we go through this this um, this other process, which is uh, has the feel of a normal 17A hearing where we invite public feedback through written comment and and um, and, a, and a public scoping meeting instead of a public uh, hearing, and we we do the best we can to gather the input from the stakeholders, and then I take an emergency action uh, uh, that I I seek uh, some consensus from the commission because an emergency action will allow us to get the rules in place in time for the season opening, but an emergency action only lasts 90 days which means within the 90 day period, we have to enact it as final. So I have to come back to you as kind of a pro forma proposal. Um, so, so today, uh, what I need to do is I need to be assured that the support that you give me for this proposal to go forward with my emergency authority won't change three or you know, four months or now, or four months from now when we when we do a final action, because I need to come back to you to enact these as, as a final at when they expire after 90 days. It would really create a lot of chaos if the commission um, didn't approve the, the final rules, which means we would be reverting back to last year's rules, which is obviously unacceptable for us to be in compliance. So um, I'm not you know, it's not one of my favorite ways to go about managing fisheries, but I, I, uh, you know, kind of beg for your indulgence and and want to let you know that we're working as hard as we can to be uh, really transparent with the public and to be as as informative uh, with our stakeholders as we can. So, um, and that that uh, obviously is, is covers the black sea bass and the scup issues. Uh, we're going to talk uh, in a. In a later um, uh, discussion about the emergency rules for uh, caught and haddock. Those are a little bit different because, um, you know, those are, are enacted by the federal government uh, without us having uh, uh, too much input. And we just want to get those done by emergency so that we can uh, have the same rules with the you know, state and federal for when the, our boats are fishing across those two lines. So getting back to uh, scup and sea bass, um, you know, what's really interesting about this is uh, the extra work that we did this year to not only uh, invite comment letters, not only to invite the scoping uh, meeting comments, but we created a first ever uh, angler feedback survey, which was something that was done in the some of the other states uh, in, in past iterations for, I believe, for this species, but also for striped bass when there was some, um, some options for striped bass regarding the slot limit. And, you know, it's a little bit humbling because uh, I think what we've learned is when it comes to recreational uh, fishing input, we tend to uh, hear the dominant voices of the for hire operators. And in this case, uh, there's a survey that was done um, that allowed someone to identify themselves either as a private angler or I'm sorry, an angler on a private vessel or as an angler on a for hire boat or as a as a um, a shore angler, and then finally, finally, as a representative of of a for hire company, and it's sort of been, you know, it's sort of fallen out in, in the ways that you would expect. But it's really interesting to see, um, you know, in some in some uh, a culmination of over 800 responses, uh, the various interests that we try to serve across these sectors. <clears throat> so. Um, so I have a recommendation um, for, for scup and sea bass. Uh, Nicola, do you want to um, sh show any of your slides at this point? 
Uh, yeah, I'll I'll provide some a little bit of brief background information and um, and then focus on the public comment that we received. Thanks. One moment. All right, how's that look? Very good, Nicola. All right, great. So um, I have been keeping the commission um, as best up to date as possible over your, your last couple meetings um, as the, the interstate and federal steps were taking um, place for the, the setting of the measures for these two species this year. Um, a quick note that summer flounder, um, which we're all often talking about at the same time is status quo this year. So we're just looking at scup and black sea bass. Sea bass. But I'll, um, I'll provide us a, a quick recap. So we're all um, on the same playing uh, level here. Um, but um, I've pre previously told you how we are looking at um, coastwide 10% reductions for both um, scup and black sea bass this year for the recreational fisheries. And that is not due to the fact that the stock is overfished or overfishing is occurring, but because we have a recreational harvest limit in the federal fishery man plant management plan and a process, um, a new process of that uses what's called a harvest control rule to establish what type of reduction or liberalization or, or status quo measures are allowed. So that's what this table shows us here is this percent change approach as it's called. And it, the, there are several improvements to it where we're, we're including the confidence intervals around the estimated harvest under the status quo measures before we compare that to the RHL, which is so, shown on the right-hand side there. Um, but even when you include those confidence intervals around the harvest estimates, um, it's above the, the recreational harvest limits for next year. So we find ourselves in that, that lowest box on the left-hand column. Um, however, because the, the stock status is above the 150% of the target biomass for both species, the amount of reduction is capped at 10% as opposed to having to precisely meet the RHL. Um, and so the reductions would have been uh, a higher level if not for this newly adopted approach. Um, once we had that coastwide reduction determined, it goes to the um, ASMSC regional processes to develop the state measures to achieve those reductions. On the SCUP side of things, um, we are in a region of, of mass through New York, um, about 95% of the SCUP coastwide or are landed um, within our region. Um, and we've tried over the years to um, work together and have largely uniform regulations, which has benefits for compliance and, and you know, perceived equity among the states. Um, so we, this is the 2022 measures among the region. Um, and when we met as a region to talk about how we were gonna meet this 10% reduction, we really focused on um, a size limit increase to achieve most of the reduction because the bag limit reduction would have to be drastic to achieve a 10% reduction because not many people are limiting out at these the high bag limits that we have for SCUP and seasonal closures would affect the states within our region differently um, for the most part. Um, there was also the council recommended federal uh, rule measures, uh, federal measures that were considered um, that decreases that to a 40 fish limit and a January through April closure. Um, and we've we've had January through April open for a couple of years now. That was one of the last liberalizations that we took, and it's given us some kind of surprising um, MRIP estimates from a few intercepts um, that uh, were, were kind of unfortunate, but part of the time series now. Um, and going from 45 to 50 fish was also one of the more liberal, one of the most recent liberalizations that we we took in this fishery, um, with regards to the the bonus season on the four higher fishery. So, as I said, um, our region focused on achieving um, the reduction with a size limit increase um, going to 10.5 inches um, for all modes was, was looked at, um, but there was concern about um, going up a more on the shore fishery where our, our data shows us that there's not the same access to large fish from by the shore based anglers, um, and that is an environmental justice concern. And so the states collectively were interested in lowering that minimum size if we could potentially. Um, so that's what you see here as the proposed measures um, within the region um, that it goes to 10 and a half inches for all mode except for shore, which decreases to 9.5 inches. 
Um, and then January through April is closed um, across all modes. And the bonus season for the for hire fishery, um, which we do in May through June, um, goes from 50 fish to 40 fish. So we did as a region adopt uh, or endorse this one option um, to move forward. One of the consequences of, of the, the model-based approach to um, analyzing measures this year is, is that you have to put in regulations for fluke scup and sea bass. And so it, it was helpful for us to kind of agree on one measure for scup to put into the model while we were all looking at our sea bass options. Um, but we sh I should note quickly that um, this option for SCUP, as well as the options for sea bass that I'll be presenting, have already gone to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and been approved for, for use. Um, and at this point, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to make changes to um, the measures that have been approved. So with SCUP, we have this option. Moving on to black sea bass, the, the management structure is a little bit different with the three, we have three regions of mass through New York, New Jersey and Delaware through North Carolina. The ASMSC determined that each state, each region would take that 10% reduction. And within our Northern region, we determined um, as we have in the past that each state would take a 10% reduction as opposed to us trying to come up with some uniform rules among the region, which would be difficult at, at this point, given um, different priorities that we've we've placed on, you know, season and, and bag uh, over the years. Um, so when we were developing a set of options for this year, um, we, we really focused those on uh, either a size limit increase or a bag limit reduction. Our season is already um, one of the, the shortest along the coast, and um, we understood from prior comment that additional shortening of the season would not be favored. Um, we also looked at um, a couple different regulations by, by, by mode um, and some that held the for higher fishery status quo given the, the limited impact that changing the for higher measures have on overall harvest given the, the relatively minor contribution of the for higher fishery to overall harvest. Um, and in you know the the different mode regulations, there was an interest. We had an interest to see if we could get some season for private anglers into the fall because that had been something that had been of interest in, in prior years, and would require a, a bag limit reduction to do that. So um, we also. I, with you know, from a management side, it would be really helpful for us to have some catch information about September and October for this fishery in terms of evaluating different measures and, and in future years. So we did develop a set of six options um, that you see here. Um, the first one looks at the increasing the minimum size to, to get that 10% reduction, and then options two through six look at um, bag changes to get the reduction. Um, and in each case, uh, the season is tweaked to get as close to uh, the 10% reduction as possible, all starting on um, Saturday, May 20th, um, and then going as long as possible. Some of the options are more complex than others, certainly with bag limit changes throughout them and, and mode specific regulations. Um, notably, you know, options five and six, the, the for hire fishery is held largely status quo um, and the, the private and shore regulations are, are reduced at the bag in order to try to get a season um, that goes into mid to late October. So this is what we took out to public hearing or public public scoping. Um, as da Dan said, we, we held um, the scoping meeting um, with, uh, you know, relatively light attendance. There's about nine people that commented largely for hire. We accepted uh, over 60 emailed comments that were, were more diverse in, in the types of stakeholders that they were coming through from. And then there was over 800 responses to the, the survey on the Black Sea Bass options. And if you didn't see it, it allowed the respondents to rank all of the six options um, in order from you know, most preferred to least preferred um, and ask them a little bit about the, the demographic information as Dan said. And, and then probably about, it was about half of the people 
also included um, in an open text box, you know, their their rationale for the the um, responses that they were giving in terms of the rankings, and and those are all in your briefing materials and a pretty interesting read. Um, so in, in general, some of the comment was, you know, uh, as expected, some displeasure with the the need to make these cuts given the stock status. You know, there's a general uh, misunderstanding about you know how we're we have to manage this to the recreational harvest limit because of the federal fisheries management plan. Um, there, as we often see with with um, proposed measures, you know. A, placing a blame elsewhere, um, some anti-commercial sentiment or anger about the MRIP data and how it drives this process and some frustration with the instability of the measures. Um, regarding SCUP overall, the comment was, you know, more limited. Um, it wasn't part of the survey because it was just one option. Um, and that I think that's why that the, the comment was limited, um, there being just one option. But there was a big interest um, to pursue a change to the um, interstate and federal fishery management plans to allow quota transfers between the commercial and recreational sectors, particularly with the um, underutilization of the SCUP um, commercial quota. Um, there was support for the separate and lower um, shore-based minimum size limit um, and an understanding as to you know why why we were considering that type of mode split. Um, and then the for hire fleet, um, many individuals either emailed or uh, spoke up at the public comment um, meeting um, to support uh, to, to disagree with the reduction in the for hire bonus season bag limit from 50 to 40 fish. Um, they were, you know, felt that that bag limit, higher bag limit is necessary to attract customers and they, they would rather go to an 11 inch minimum size because they're already harvesting much larger fish um, and they felt that this would have less of an impact on their businesses. Um, and you know, hope that we could uh, try to take this forward at, at, at that time. Um, moving on to black sea bass, um, I'm going to show some of the you know infographics here that are the survey results. Um, in general, individuals that either emailed a comment or came to the scoping meeting, I think also. Um, responded to the survey. So I think they're reflective of, of you know, most of the people that were involved in this public comment process. Um, so overall, there of the 807 responses, the, the vast majority were coming from individuals that identified as recreational anglers as opposed to for hire businesses. Um, and within that group of recreational anglers, um, most of them identified, identified as, um, you know, going out on a, a private boat as their main um, method of fishing for black sea bass, um, which is agrees with the, the MRIP data that we have that indicates about 90% of our harvest in the state is from private vessels. Um, but there were responses from individuals who said that a party or charter boat is their primary method of, of fishing for black sea bass, as well as some shore-based anglers. Um, we also asked about um, where they go fishing um, and um, asked to check all that they apply, all that applied here. So not surprisingly, Buzzards Bay uh, and the sounds were the primary fishing areas. I, I think it would be pretty interesting to, to ask this question over the years and see how this is changing for a species like black sea bass that we, that we know is um, having a, a shift in it. Um, and we also asked about the number of fishing trips people had taken um, in 2020 to uh, gauge gauge their avidity in this this fishery. So getting on to some of the results, um, the, this break these tables break down the rankings by different groups of respondents. The the first section is all 807 responses, no breakdown, and um, option one, the 16 and a half minimum size, was the um, most preferred. Um, not in the majority, but but it ranked the highest as the most prefer preferred. Um, the second box there of recreational anglers 
it's very similar to the all responses rankings because of um, the, the dominance of the recreational anglers in, in the all of responses. But um, in general, many of those comments that you know, reflected on the, the abundance of fish well over the minimum size, be it 16 or 16 and a half. Um, so many individuals seem to think that this was, you know, something that they could live with and, um, and that the rules that results kind of reflected the least amount of change from 2022 and that the simplicity of them would make them easier to adhere to rather than the options that, you know, change, change the bag throughout the course of the year. Um, there, there were definitely some comment um, that one or two fish um, in some of those options also was was too low that, that the cost of going out on a private vessel at this point has, has risen with with fuel and inflation. Um, and that going out for one or two fish, you know, isn't worth their while, um, you know, kind of similar to the, the comment that we hear from the for hire businesses about, um, you know, the, the need not, not to reduce the bag to keep clients coming out. Um, but oh, one of the, the strongest sentiments that we received from recreate individuals that identified as recreational anglers was uh, a pretty ardent opposition to mode splits. Um, they you know, commented on, I encourage you to read the comments, but there, there was, you know, comments about the unfairness, a kind of pay to play um, type of sentimentality. Um, and they spoke, many of them spoke to their investment in the fishery and their impact on the economy being, you know, just as great as, as the for hire fleet. Um, so that was very different from what we heard from for hire captains who, um, not surprisingly, because they were have been encouraged us over the years to propose mode splits, but they supported the mode splits um, by and large, um, with a particular preference for for option six, um, which holds the for higher fleet status quo and goes to um, a three, then one, then three fish bag limits for the private mode, um, and extends the season into October. But they preferred that option. Um, they're they're interestingly the the second and Third choices there for, as most preferred were option one and option five among the four higher fleet. Um, but again, they, they really put a, a lot of their comments put a priority on not going lower than, than four fish, um, which ruled out options two and three for them. Um, and then the, the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is, is that how even though four higher captains really favored option six, when we looked at the responses from recreational anglers that identified as going out mostly on, on party and charter vessels, they fell into the category, um, not as strongly, but they fell into the category of putting option one as their most preferred as well, uh, which is a 16 and a half inch size limit. Um, so that that sums up the, the comments. Um, and so I'm going to pass it back to Dan to talk about our um, preferred measures for 2023. Thank you, Nicola. Um, great job. The, uh, the survey that you guys um, devised, I think, was the brainchild of, of you, Sam Tuesdell, and our, our new outreach coordinator, um, Neil McCoy. Is that right? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, so um, really a, a great job on that. So, um, so Commission, we have two separate species. The issues are different. You know, we, we have a SCUP proposal. As Nicholas said, it's, it's already been um, uh, kind of fully baked among the states. Um, do we want to cover that one first? And, and Nicola, do you want to, do you want to just take any questions from the Commission about the, 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 um, the SCUP proposal, which was was crafted as a as a um, a half inch minimum size increase uh, for private a a uh, but for shore anglers a slight decrease, which you mentioned. Um, a lot of the states are paying more attention to the to the um, you know, I guess it's called social justice or environmental justice the the opportunity for folks who don't have the wherewithal to get out on the water to still to still access some fish so this would be a first for us something that um, other states like Connecticut and I think Rhode Island have already dabbled in um, 
and uh, and then the the ten fish reduction in the bonus season for the for hire with that same half inch minimum size. Um, do do the commission members want to um, ask any other questions about how Nicola and her fellow state representatives um, came to the, that as sort of the the sole option? Questions for Nicola. Leo? Leo, you recognize. Leo? Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to ask Nicola a, a little procedural uh, question as to how the ASMFC um, with one was SCUP, it seems like you said we, if we were to make any changes, it would be nearly impossible because this is something that has been accepted by, I guess, all the states. I may be, you know, articulating this incorrectly, but why did they, the ASMFC decides to go, this is what SCUP's going to be, but yet leaves the black sea bass uh, question up to each individual state. I was just curious as yes. to why they went this route. Uh, it, it was really within our region that we offered. We only offered up one option for SCUP, whereas we, you know, each each of the states put forward more options for black sea bass, um, and and that relates to you know the fact that we wanted to work as a region to approve uh, you know uniform SCUP regulations, um, whereas black sea bass it's really a state by state. Um, situation so each state could you know run as many options as as possible that they that they wanted to look at um but at this point asmc is waiting for us to let them know in the coming days what each of our measures is going to be because they need to provide that information to NOAA fisheries um and have the these measures um uh baked into the federal rulemaking process as as well. So that's why the, the, the timeline would really be very difficult to make any changes at this point. Understood. Th I understand. Thank you so much, Nicola. Thank you. And, and Khalil, just a point of clarification. Um, there is a slight variation in these rules uh, pertaining to the timing of the bonus season, but that's not a new reg. Historically, bonus seasons uh, are uh, those periods given to the for hire industry when scup are sort of super abundant and um, there is an allowance for the the um, the bag limits for the for hire sector to be much larger. Ours is in the months of uh, May and June, but Nicola, can you comment when the uh, bonus seasons are for the other states? Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York do it in September, October. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Questions for Nicola? Okay. So, so yeah, so th then let's move on to the more controversial one, which is black sea bass. And I think Nicola has um, done a great job at, at depicting um, the responses and so also some of the issues that are in play. And I had urged her to um, bring forward some of those other options four five and six so that we could try to get some fall fishing um, you know in the in the database to understand catch rates because sometimes when we've gone to uh, ask for uh, fishing days in wave five which is September and October um, with insufficient or imprecise data sometimes the projections can seem uh, a little too um, uh, high and and some, often we don't get those uh, those benefits of of um, opening those those fishing days, and so that to me has been um, something that I've been interested in. Plus the fact that some anglers, like especially out on the islands, like the Nantucketers particularly, have been kind of begging for fall fishing because that's when they they probably see more fish than any other time of the year. Those those early spawning uh, aggregations don't really show up on, around Nantucket until um, until later in the uh, well, they don't show up at all there, but the fish that are available to them would be available later in the year. So I was part of uh, of the thinking presenting uh, six different options. But having said that, um, those last three options when we were trying to get some fall fishing, you know, more or less held the 
uh, for hire, fishery, uh, harmless. And, and I think that was largely the appeal of the for hire sector for, you know, option six and option five and four, in that they were able to, by and large, maintain the, the 16 inch fish, the, uh, the, the four fish bag uh, with, with very little uh, changes. And most of the conservation would, it would be coming out of the, um, of the, the private um, angler sector. And so when I look at the results, I just see a really strong preference uh, for the simpler regulations for the, to the maintaining of the four fish limit that everyone seems that, that that's important to them, maybe more important to the, to the average angler than we had uh, really uh, forecasted. And so um, for all those reasons, um, I would like to move forward uh, with an emergency um, action to um, simply raise that, that size by a half inch and, and maintain the bag and not uh, what we call uh, split the modes, mode meaning for hire versus private uh, anglers, um, but keep it consistent uh, between them at this time. And I'm sure some of the commission members would like to weigh on on that, but I, I, I wanna go with that um, based on the, the survey results. Um, I, I've, I'm sensing some, some, um, you know, kind of uh, anxiety among average anglers to to some of the proposals uh, where they perceive that the for hire sector uh, uh, is seeking, you know, less conservation. And I'm even getting uh, some letters from from some of the state legislators on behalf of their of their constituents. I, I've gotten two on this particular issue, so I don't think that's the great a great way to go uh, down the road in the future in terms of um, treating the two sectors um, in that differential fashion. I, I much prefer to keep things as consistent as possible. Granted, we already have the scup bonus season, but that's been uh, well established going back over 20 years. So um, I would welcome the commission to, to discuss this uh, with us. And remember what I, what I wanna do is I wanna get um, enough commission members to, Em embrace this or some other proposal that you think I should go forward with and sort of understand that that we 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 need the commission to then repeat uh, the support for that that option three or four months from now when I come back and ask for approval of the permanent reg. So I think it's appropriate to open up the discussion. Very well. Questions, discussion. Vice Chair Doc. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have a point of information question and it has to do with SCUP. You have noted, are there any questions? I did not have any questions, but I do have comments concerning SCUP with some recommendations. Are we still in the question phase or the comment phase? Because it appears now with Black Sea Bass, you're looking for questions as well as comments because I do have some recommendations when it comes to SCUP. Okay, well, let's start with the SCUP and clear that off the table, and then we'll get into the meat of the Black Sea Bass discussion. So go ahead, Michael. Now, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dan. Thank you, Nicola, and I thank DMF and his staff for all the work they've done to put this information together and come up with these options. Uh, a few observations and then comments. I mean, I think it is apparent that the public continues to be disappointed. There's no lack of scup. There's no lack of black sea bass. We have tremendous numbers in our waters. And we've seen the past several years, our seasons and bag limits continue to get cut as we continue to have this tremendous amount of numbers. We see the Southern state or the state South of us with bag limits and seasons that are more fruitful than ours that are impacting the four hire fleet. So we have another year now with a 10% reduction. And I just wanna point that out because I believe it was evident based upon the public comment of the continued disappointment. So understand, we understand that the harvest control rule that was implemented, the MSC and the harvest control rule minimized the depth of the cuts that would have occurred. They would have been more significant to 10%, but this inconsistency has much pain on the public and those here in Massachusetts. My comments first will be associated with SCUP. Um, 
I would, as noted in your in the memo, the commercial fleet catches about forty percent of their quota for scup. Uh, the mechanism presently doesn't exist for that to be transferred recreationally or vice versa. Unfortunately, that was shut down, I believe, shut down two, roughly two years ago. So to something more immediate, I would recommend that Mass DMF go back to the Atlantic States Marine, Marine Fishery Commission, go back to National Marine Fishery Service and petition and request that there be some flexibility to have that 50 fish number. And in, in the instance of what was recommended by the public was 50 fish with 11 inch minimum during that uh, May 20th to September 4th, I believe it was. But to petition them to give flexibility in order to take that into consideration so there's not a detrimental impact to these businesses, as well as the environmental justice that was noted for those that rely on these fish and go in these boats to catch those fish. So th that's item one. Item two, which is more long range, then to um, approach whether it's a combination of the Mid-Atlantic Council as well as Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission. The need for to change this, this the fact that you cannot share between the quota between REC or back sea bass to make it balance out if one is way other to cover for the other end. Because ultimately the fish are there. Let's get access to those fish, access to the public to get them. But to go back to the Mid-Atlantic, Atlantic States Marine Fishery, Mid Fishermen Commission to get that changed, and hopefully this time the votes will be there uh, from our southern states to make that happen. So that, that's my recommendations for SCUP. Um, I'll be happy to hear if there's any comment to that and whether we could proceed with such. Thank you. And yeah, um, so Nicola, uh, what Mike is asking for is us to petition the ASMFC and the Mid Atlantic Council um, to modify, I guess, the plan to allow um, sector transfers. And and Mike, Mike's point is a valid one. I think in Massachusetts alone, we have about a 50% underage in our SCUP quota, uh, which is uh, for the period May through September. And um, I, we're not capable of catching that quota um, because that quota was built during a time period when we allowed night dragging, uh, three and a half inch mesh in uh, the auto trawl as well as pair trawling. And so that's, that, that quota will go underutilized uh, into the future. So, so Nicola, in your view, if we, if we prepare that letter um, you know, in the in the days ahead, and try to get it on the ASMFC agenda. What do you think the time frame might be for an amendment uh, to the plan to um, to maybe get this fixed for next year? Um, I, I guess the the good news is that it it would not need to be a full scale amendment to the FMP to allow sector transfers. Um, when Mike was referencing about two years ago that um, sector transfers were shot down, um, they weren't added to the plan at that time, but it was made an issue that could be added either by an addendum in the ASMC process or a framework in the council process. And so that's, you know, a six month process as opposed to a multi-year process potentially. Um, so I would suggest that we could write a letter to the you know, council and, and commission and ask this to be prioritized as a 2023 um, issue. Um, there and would that are, be to the policy board? Um, I, probably the, the management board, the species management board. Yeah. But, are they scheduled to meet at this next uh, quarterly meeting of the commission? I'm not certain, but if not, yeah. then the policy board would be another avenue. Um, but the, the the sector transfers was something that was brought up at the last council meeting, though, as really mm -hmm. a, some you know interest to to look at that um, again. You know, coming yeah. coming out of the need for these the ten percent reduction for SCUP, knowing that there's a lot of quota commercial quota underutilization. So we're not the only ones thinking about it, which which should help um, progress okay. to be made. Thank you, Nicola. Michael. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Nicola. I appreciate that. Anything we can do uh, that, that that could make this possibly give you change would be appreciated. Um, you know, more something more long term. You and I sat in those meetings, those climate change recent meeting about four weeks ago to have a discussion about shifting stocks and and. Uh, Black sea bass was one of the examples in many meetings I sit in on. Black sea bass is the example of a shifting stock and the haves and the have nots. And in our instance where this stock has shifted, we have tremendous numbers. We're at the leading edge of that uh, biomass, which I have to question whether that still is the case because they're, they're getting them all the way up in Maine in the lobster traps. But with that, there was discussions during that meeting about changing the way we manage these stocks and whether you're at the leading edge of the stock or at the hind end of the stock and in between. Because as noted here, we have a regionalization uh, of, we have to regionalize our discussions and our management of this fishery from New York all the way up to Massachusetts. And, and how can we change this to be fair and equitable to the leading edge of that stock, which would be Massachusetts. So I throw that out there that hopefully with the Mid-Atlantic and Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission, you could advance that uh, um, topic to make that be addressed so it would reflect, uh, 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 reflect a quota that would be consistent with what we observe in the water. That naturally is a little bit more long term and is not more immediate, but I, I'd just like to put that on the table also. Thank you. So, Mike, um, Nicola and I will draft that letter. We'll uh, run it by the chairman and, and you just for your information. And uh, we'll submit that and it re request some time at the policy board meeting at the upcoming ASMFC meeting. And because those are, um, are hybrid meetings, uh, I would you know, welcome you to you know, maybe comment as, as a member of the public, um, you know, as not one of the commissioners, at uh, at that time, so why don't we why don't we take that as a as an approach? Uh, thank you, Dan. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. So we've segued back to black sea bass, I presume. Yes, um, and I guess I don't know if Mike, you want to uh, open up the discussion on on black sea bass, but as you can um, see, I'll just briefly reiterate. I I think the the um, the survey was was quite revealing for me, and and I think the the uh, the path of least anxiety is to just increase that that size limit by a half and maintain common rules between those two sectors. And um, but I I welcome the the discussion. And again, I'm I'm asking for sort of support or or uh, sort of a pledge that when I come back to you three or four months from now. That you'll resupport, or you'll 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 support a final action, which will be um, similar to an action that I that I'll take as an emergency. So, has anybody got comments about black sea bass? Mike Pierdnock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, uh, Dan. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. You take a quick look at the survey results and it's along party lines, but there's there's a few things hidden here that with film, if additional details, one could come out with a different conclusion. And to no surprise, it's, it's been noted, option one, 49% of the recreational community was for option one, four fish, 16 and a half inches. No surprise that um, option six was 50% of the four higher fleet was for that option. And for various reasons that uh, I will get into in a few minutes. But one thing that was really revealing to me, and this gets to the recreational shore side angler as well as recreational private vessel, which as you see here in black sea bass, we have it for SCUP, a private vessel shore and four higher vessels, but none is proposed for black sea bass. My opinion, that's the future. That's the future of what we need to see. And the future is now. We have increased temperatures, shifting stocks and fish, black sea bass, SCUP, summer flounder. As the temperatures increase, they go into deeper waters. 
who is this sector here, or excuse me, the user type is most impacted by that? The private vessel, excuse me, the shoreside angler. The private vessel is the one that is rich enough to have a boat to venture into those waters, which are cooler as those stocks move offshore. And then the shoreside angler doesn't have the ability to do that, but they can go on the four hire vessel to catch a fish because the four hire vessel is the bus for the, rec for the recreational anglers to transit and go to areas where there's access to the fish. That makes sense of why there has to be a bag limit which makes that worthwhile, as well as the costs that needs to make that worthwhile. So when you look at the one option with the summaries where the, you look at the recreational shore side, the distribution was different. 25% wanted option one, 25% wanted option two, 27% wanted option six. That shoreside angler is indicating to me that they have this change in, in conditions as temperatures increase that early in the season or late in the season when the water's colder, the bigger fish are in. Then they move out. Then they go on the boat, the four hire vessel to get those fish. That's why one would like option six. So that's the way I read that, but then why do we have this discrepancy with uh, option one is 16 inches for a fish? And then these other options with split modes have uh, at, at four fish, 16 and a half inches with different modes. Well, there's been much chatter and much uh, discussion from those on the water, especially last year, that they went out May 20th and they weren't able to catch their, their bag limit within an hour. What's going on? It may have taken all day or they weren't able to catch their bag limit at all. Last year, temperatures increased. The deep, bigger fish went into deeper water. The inexperienced recreational or private vessel owner that may have not had that experience and knowledge was not able to venture to or, or go to those areas where there was deep, deeper. Four hire fleet did that. Four hire fleet continues to go into deeper and cooler water orders with time. That then also points out that your survey points that, well, the person that goes on the four hire vessel, uh, the recreational angler also noted that 16 and a half may be okay. Yes, because the four hire vessel is going to catch those fish because they, they go to deeper waters where they're located. But ultimately with that 16 to 16 and a half inch increase, last year there was increased discards because with increased temperatures, the bigger fish moved off, there was smaller fish. It's gonna happen again this year. And it's gonna happen with the fish arriving sooner and then this, this kind of condition occurring. Increased discards, we, we don't want that to be a problem now and tw then in 2023, uh, well, the end of 23, 24, we come back and then another cut and reduction is proposed. So that's where I read this a little bit differently with the results. And I, I, I also tie into these ongoing climate change meetings that I've gone to that they've pointed out, this is where it's going if it's not here already. Private vessels, shore side, four high vessels, separate seasons and bag limits for each because with increased temperatures, the dynamics are different for each. But I want to know, we don't want to forget the shoreside angler and environmental justice. Many of these people don't have the ability to, to own a boat, and they need to be able to go on the party boat, which is cheaper than your typical six pack. We can't forget them and deny them access to the fishery via that mode. So. You know, personally, that's why based on these different items that I've noted, I, I think the option six is the way to go. These different mode breaks out are the future of, as a result of our environmental conditions. It's more of a progressive climate change uh, approach. And just as a final thought, as we get into numbers, once again, this may not be all that it appears. There's 191,897 saltwater licensed anglers. Based upon that number, 
and the number of people or individuals that were recreational that responded to the survey, that was 0.4% of the recreational community. There's 815 for hire vessels, 51 responded. 6.2% of the for hire community responded. That's telling with where the really the percentages are because they're always going to be outnumbered because the recreational community is is more more significant in numbers. So I question that. Yeah. And that last thing is that the meeting that we had in person, well, in person, Zoom was the public showed up was overwhelmingly for hire with some recreational people on it, but we all know in fairness that when you, to get those that are impacted in the environmental justice end, it's rare that you can get them to respond to a survey and rare that you can get them to show up for a meeting for various factors. So uh, we just need to keep this in mind with what con conclusions we may come to with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, you make some really good points. Um, I would, um, just note that this is the first time we've ever had a differential size limit on a species uh, that, is, that is what's being proposed for scop. We've never done that before, and I'd be anxious to get a year under our belt, you know, working with the environmental police to see what their observations uh, will be about uh, the, the compliance and the education challenges there. Um, but my question for Nicola, um, Nicola, are any of the other states on the Black Sea Bass front considering that, um, a smaller size limit for shore-based anglers? Uh, no, there's no size limit mode splits. Okay. But maybe after, after maybe in the future there could be, just to, to get to Mike's um, point. It, it's, it's not ruled out, certainly. Yeah. Um, okay. I did want to comment a little bit on the, on the size distribution data that we have mm -hmm. um, between, and the, the contrast with, with SCUP and, and CBAS. Um, so this is these are some slides that I had from the scoping meeting. Um, but on the on the right hand side, um, this is showing us the the length distribution of scup that are harvested um, by for hire, private, and shore. And you know part of our reason for looking at a different shore based size limit is because you see that the fish that are retained are are much more clumped around the minimum size limit for scup, whereas vessel-based harvest has access to, to larger fish, um, whether it's for hire or private. And, you know, in contrast to that, or um, we really don't have similar data for black sea bass. Um, this is a similar graph. Our, the shore-based harvest of black sea bass is, is so, is a very, very minor part of, of the overall catch. And so we really don't have enough intercept data to, to know what that is like. Um, but the, the availability of fish to for hire and, and private on the vessels, vessel-based harvest, it looks pretty similar. Um, so that that's why, you know, we didn't propose, part of the reason for not proposing different size limits um, within the, the Black Sea Bass fishery. Um, oh, and lastly, um, Mike, you had you had asked me for you know discard information that's associated with each option. So I thought I would just show that as well. Um, and because because the model that were used to evaluate these measures, um, they provide you harvest estimates as well as release estimates. And um, I just got this yesterday, so I was in interested myself to see that option six um, provided had the had the highest. Um, number of releases associated with it. Um, and option you know, one was lower than that. But Nicola, those numbers all seem to be in the same neighborhood. They're all pretty close, yes. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but I don't think there's an indication that option mm -hmm. one is going to um, result in much higher um, dead discards than any other option. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, if I can add lib, uh, earlier today, we heard from two council members, those being Melanie Griffin and Michael Pierdnock, and a commission member who, who sits at the table and votes, Nicola Meserve. And we heard about this climate, these summits that they're having, climate change summits. 
And I think I've been on the commission now 17 years. And I believe the director is looking for commission members to support him in this emergency rule action today and come back three or four months from now and ratify it with a vote. But this has been angst for DMF and the staff for as long as I've been on sitting as a member on the commission. And I've often brought it up to states south of us. And as you've heard, there are you know, three different regions, the Northern region, New Jersey, and the Southern region. People at the Mid-Atlantic don't call this a, a shift, they call it an expansion. And their contention is that they have as many fish today as they did. But my push has been, the, being how DMF, I mean, every year the gun is held to their head on regulations, size limits on black sea bass, because we are the first state on the East Coast to catch black sea bass in May. And I've asked that we offset the year. So that sixth wave, which doesn't come back to management until late February or early March gets, gets rolled back. So you're actually starting the year on November 1st. So that becomes wave one as opposed to wave six. So that by the time ASMSC meets in winter meetings in February, we have an idea as a state, BMF has an idea of what restraints or constraints or liberalizations they'll be able to give their state recreational fishermen. And I've gotten no place with that. So I am dependent on council members who go to these climate changes to bring this up because nobody wants to hear it at the Mid-Atlantic. But I, I think there needs to be a management change in the FMP, especially with these waves, the way they're set up now. Uh, I guess it's been like that forever, but it certainly isn't working for our state, for our recreational fishermen, and for our DMF staff. Thank you. Bill Amaru. Bill, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's been a very interesting discussion at several levels. But I, I'd like to comment uh, about the Black Sea Bass Plan and, and something that I heard Dan say earlier. Dan, this is not an accusation by any stretch. I, I just, I heard you say that consistency in, in the management strategies is an important factor in, in our thinking. And I agree that, that consistency is important. However, when there are differences between fisheries, I don't see why we should be afraid to identify those differences and act accordingly. And in black sea bass, uh, recreational versus the, the higher fishery, to me, are two distinctly different ways of approaching uh, the capture of black sea bass for a population. The ad hire, it, it needs to be looked at, as Mike has said, as a, as a future and as a way of accessing the fish that are no longer accessible to the degree they once were for the inshore angler and they are different fisheries. So um, I agree with Mike's point about that. I, and uh, as far as what what uh, I just heard uh, our chairman say about the refusal of, of some, certain management bodies to identify and deal with the realities of shifting stocks, that, that, that augurs for severe difficulties down the road. Uh, I mean, I understand it somewhat political in these issues and there's turf issues at stake here about who has access to what. But if, if there's a group of scientists who can prove to me that the stock distributions haven't uh, changed radically in the last decade and that they won't continue to change in the future, uh, I'll take them all out to lunch, the most expensive restaurant in New York City. They'll never convince me that this isn't happening and it should be dealt with in the reality and the form in which it's taking place. All right, those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Barrett, hands. My pair, do you have a follow-up comment? Yeah, that's, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just want to point out, and as, as Ray Ray pointed out, 
just to point out, this is, this is a public meeting and everybody's listening in that mass DMF goes to the table to try to do what's best for us. And, and they continue to do such. And it's the Southern states where we get outvoted on many matters, as we've just noted. That's the one way with the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission. With the Mid-Atlantic, we have no vote. There's no votes that we have at the table. So we, we continue to have this monkey wrench is thrown in when these items come up to do what's fair and equitable for, for us up here, which may, may not be the case when it's done for political reasons. That climate change meeting was uh, an attempt to identify those issues and try to address it from a management standpoint, as well as a, a stock standpoint and to do what what's fair um, for each state. But that's gonna take time. But I just wanna note that the DMF goes to the table, fights for us, and not get any impression that that isn't the case. The, the only other thing I'd like to note is, is that we, we bring, well, this is another thing that's brought up about every year, and it has to do with our Black Sea Bass discards. And we have a different situation here because we're catching them early in the season in shallow waters. And I suspect Nicola and maybe help me with this, that when they do that model run to assume the number of dead discards, we're assuming the average from New York all the way up to Massachusetts. And this is where it gets into the separating out whether you're at the leading edge or the high end or in the middle and making a management measure that's specific to Massachusetts. Our dead discards rate is likely a lot much less than when they're in New York and 100, 200, 300, 400 feet of water. So I don't know, or I hope the opportunity exists that we could also interject and and get that to be considered uh, with a model that then can be specific to Massachusetts as a conservation measure. So that, that's just another thing to throw out there uh, as a, a recommendation to helpfully help us in the future of, of you know, our, our ultimately our, our seasons, our quotas, seasons and bag limits. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Comments about black sea bass, questions for Nicola? Khalil? Khalil, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a question. Uh, I realized that uh, Dan and DMF and uh, the MFAC are trying to make a decision for, for Massachusetts. But I'm curious as to how New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, how they have, um, if, if Dan has that information, how they have uh, addressed the, the reduction that needs to be taken. That would be a question for Nicola. She works closely with those people. Nicola? Yeah, I'm just finding a slide. Um, so they're, they're still working through their processes, at least some of the states are. Um, but this slide shows you the options that were approved for Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. Um, you'll notice that all of the Rhode Island Options include a 16 and a half inch size limit, um, although option one does include 16 inches on the for hire, but um, so I, I guess I misspoke earlier, um, that option was put forward. Um, I have heard that the stakeholders in Rhode Island preferred option two, um, but Rhode Island's um, Fisheries Commission meeting isn't until um, early April, I believe. Um, for Connecticut, um, I heard that they're a, a bit more leery of the, their 16 and a half inch option and looking more closely at option three, which is includes an in-season closure of two weeks to achieve the reduction. And in New York, um, their Marine Fisheries Commission um, met and um, they determined that they would go with their option one here, which is a 16 and a half inch size limit to achieve the reduction. Um, in New Jersey, which is outside of our, our unit, um, they, da, 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 the New Jersey Fisheries Commission voted for option one here for New Jersey, which goes to a one fish bag for July and August to achieve um, most of their cut. That answer your question, Khalil. It, it does, and okay. I and, and, it, and it's interesting. It's interesting that um, most of the other states are, are are not going to the 
different modes um, and trying to keep it, I guess, as in my mind, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so uh, thank you for that information. You, as usual, your, your, your research is very comprehensive and greatly appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Khalil. Questions or comments on black sea bass? Tim Brady. Tim, you're recognized. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I just, mine should be pretty quick. I would just like to um, piggyback on, um, uh, mostly on what Mike said, but, um, you know, we, if you're trying to operate a uh, for hire, particularly a party boat, um, you're, um, you know, you're operating under a whole different set of circumstances than a recreational angler. And um, this is the future. I mean, we're, to be able to operate a business is just an entirely different situation. And even the recreational anglers that are fishing on my boat are not fishing on their own licenses, most of which, you know, most of them are avid recreational anglers as well, but they're fishing on my license when they're on my boat. Um, and they don't have any idea how much I paid for fuel that day, for bait, um, how far in advance I had to get the crew on board, um, you know, how much I had to put into engine repairs over the winter. It's just an entirely operating a business. It's, it's a commercial fishery. And the bottom line is it's a commercial fishery. And, you know, um, the more that we can look at, um, you know, how the for hire um, vessels operate versus a recreational vessel. And, and again, as Mike, as Mike said, if I'm charging 50 bucks to go out on a headboat, um, to go catch black sea bass, um, that that's providing access. I mean, a recreational angler, 50 bucks, they're going to spend 50 bucks on a rod, reel, bait, gas to go fish somewhere, even off the shore. Um, so it, it is, we're providing access. And I, you know, I hope we continue to look at that because, you know, what I do and what my neighbor does who's, um, you know, who's going out in a kayak and, and fishing when he wants to and enjoying himself. It's just an entirely different situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Welcome home. Comments and questions for Nicola? Mike? You recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nicola, can you go back to the, the, the when you have Rhode Island, Connecticut, and, and New York options? Please. Yes, just give me just give me one second to get to that slide. Uh, thank you. There you go. Uh, thank you. I mean, as noted, Rhode Island and Connecticut are, are neighbors. There, there's a breakout of for hire and private shore side. Yeah, yes, it does not break it out into the shore side angler. And uh, I would hope that would be considered in the future uh, because of even specific to Massachusetts because of the conditions we're, we've observed. Um, but it may not be justified based upon the fact, as you said, that there's there's few people fishing for black CBS from shore. But Note, when you go to the bag limit for four hire, in every instance, Rhode Island, it's six. Let's see, six in their, their key season. Earlier in the season, they don't have a fishery like us, but it has a bag limit of six. You go to Connecticut, they have a bag limit of seven for the four hire later, later in the season. Um, and th this is where when we try to compete against the abutting states, with, with their bag limits or go down to New York and New Jersey with they even have additional numbers in which they can catch. They, they don't want to come up here. They, they can go to they have alternatives. And in this case in Massachusetts, we used to have a fall fishery that went to the end of October. That that black sea bass fishery is closed. So now what's occurred? The, 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 the recreational community goes to uh, Rhode Island and can fish for tog, can fish for black sea bass, can fish for cod, the whole you know species, uh, cross section species that are open. And they're not doing any bilkings up here as all of you can get is tog. They wanna have the ability to get black sea bass. 
And when we're out there on the water, me and others, there's no lack of catching black sea bass while the tog are in. That's when the cooler water comes back in while the tog are coming in and the black sea bass come back into the shallow waters because it's cooler. So we have this disconnect. And then ultimately have, we have this impact in the four hire fleet with lack of any fishery from, what is it, September 4th on uh, because of black sea bass for a lack of bookings because of the lack of black sea bass. That impacts the whole economy. Booking hotels, restaurants, you name it. So this is where when we get into measures from abutting states, how they are set up that also have a detrimental impact on us where uh, the different variables that need to be taken into consideration for each state to do what works. So I, I just wanna note that because uh, this does tell it all between this and looking at the New Jersey and, and what their bag limits are because that's what we always hear. And if we keep cutting, we can't go below four black sea bass. It's just not gonna work. The, 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 what, what's left of the four hire fleet will be crippled if you go below four. And we, you've heard the comments about SCUP. That's why if, if the day of reckoning is coming, it's gonna get worse. If that's gonna happen with additional quotas, we have to have it broken out so the four hire can survive and we have environmental justice and equity and consideration for the haves and the have nots and those that can't afford to buy a boat and have a center console that can go around and get on the fish well, as a private recreational angler. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Michael. So, so this is really challenging for us because you can, there's obviously a smattering of states. There's states that have no sp spring opening whatsoever. There's states here that have low bag limits in the spring and early summer that our for hire fleet would never live with. So I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to split the baby here by maintaining uh, this, the status quo, at least for this season, to the degree that people can continue to operate their businesses, which I, I don't think are, are, are being squeezed out. Um, I, I think things are fairly successful with that four fish limit. And I just think this is the easiest path forward for this year. As far as the equity going across states, that's always an issue that we should discuss. And, um, you know, maybe we can, um, we can talk about that with, with Nicola, um, with some of the interested commission members um, as a means to sort of negotiate with the other states going forward. I, I agree. Um, but there's a little bit more than meets the eye here. I mean, um, I believe the Connecticut uh, differential and for higher bag limits uh, came with a, in the early years, came with a, uh, an agreement that, that the captain and crew wouldn't take any fish. And I don't know if that lived on, but that's sort of the camel in the tent that how things be, you know, kind of trend into that, that new direction. Um, and, and that particular sector was able to gain more benefits. The fact that Connecticut has a season that goes right through the end of the year, I still don't understand that. And I'm certainly willing to work with Nicola and throw a few elbows and try to get more fish from Massachusetts. But my job today is to try to get a proposal um, that, that this commission um, would, would not oppose and then would, then would, uh, would support um, come summertime. And I'd like to move forward with a 16 and a half inch uh, for both sectors and have a four fish limit for both sectors and um, to continue to work with Nicola, um, you know, to try to get some, some uh, more uh, access to these fish. Cause I think everybody um, on, you know, in this call uh, understands that Massachusetts is probably getting the, the short end of the stick. Thank you, Director. Any other comments? I'm not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. So, Ray, I would ask the commission if there's any objection to me moving forward with these emergency regulations. And we have all nine members on this. And, and even if, uh, so I guess I'm asking for a pledge that uh, whatever feelings you bring forward now, you would maintain those so we can keep uh, order on the water come summer. So are there any objections to me um, moving forward those two proposals as emergencies? 
Barrett. Not seeing any objections, Mr. Oh, Mike Fairdock objects. No, 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 no objection. Oh, okay. Can I have, Mr. Chairman, can I have a comment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, but as Dan just said, this is this is going to be an emergency action, but we are going to have to come back and ratify this. So hopefully your comment will be constructive. It most certainly will, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I will reluctantly uh, agree with option one, but with the multiple items that have been pointed out, we need for them to be addressed and hopefully they will be. And next year we see the breakout of private shore and for hire. I don't need to re go over again all the things that were noted, but I will reluctantly, uh, I'm fine with option one, but I'm concerned with the discards, time will tell. And uh, hopefully uh, we can move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So I think you've got consensus amongst the commission members, Dan. All right, I, I truly appreciate that. Um, thank you. This is uh, this is difficult. It's it's always awkward, um, but I, I appreciate the support, and I also appreciate the debate. And I think uh, all the all myself and all the staff have um, have a lot to think about going forward from, over the next year, especially in negotiations with the other states. Yeah, so, I, I just have ahead. a closing remark here, Dan. I'm really dependent on Melanie and Michael at these climate change summits, along with Nicholas' support, uh, to start moving management actions. You know, uh, we've listened to it for too long. Uh, you know, it's an expansion. Uh, we know it's a shift. Uh, so hopefully, as council members, they'll be able to talk to Mid-Atlantic council members and mediate these issues because it, it's been nothing but a tragedy for DMF and recreational fishermen in this state for as long as I've been on the commission. Every year, it's the same situation. We come back and it's an emergency action because we really don't have time to go out to public hearing and come back. You know, we it's all done on the fly. And that's because of the way the fishery is presently managed with the with these waves. Thank you. Understood. Okay, Raymond, um, we'll move on to the cod and haddock limits. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Griffin is going to uh, speak briefly about the the uh, actions that the council has taken and that NIMS uh, will soon take and how this emergency rule fits in. Yep, thank you. So hello again. And um, as Director McKiernan noted earlier, the division is proposing to adopt recreational measures for Gulf of Maine cod, Gulf of Maine haddock, and Georgia's bank cod that complement proposed federal changes. And these are for the upcoming 2023 fishing year that starts on May 1st. So before I get into the specific regulatory changes, I thought I'd provide some brief background on how we got here, given so much of this action is undertaken through the New England Council public process. And Mike Piernock, I apologize, you've already lived through this, but uh, it'll be a little summary of what you've already seen. So around January each year, the New England Council is consulted on its recommendations for rule changes, and then NIMS undertakes federal rulemaking to implement those, those rules. Because the Commonwealth does try to uh, do its part to support sustainable recreational fishing, uh, the division typically proposes complementary measures um, through our distinct public process. So we end up with these two parallel processes trying to achieve the same end. Unfortunately, as Director McKenna noted earlier, due to the timing of a final federal rule, we often have to use emergency rulemaking to get state rules in place in a timely fashion. And I'll touch on that again at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So there are two ground fish stocks that are allocated distinct recreational sub ACLs or annual catch limits, and that's Gulf of Maine cod and Gulf of Maine haddock. And each year we have the possibility of amending those recreational regulations 
based on both a look back at whether recent harvest has been over or under catch limits and a look forward to how projected catch aligns with the upcoming fishing years sub ACL. Next slide. So this slide is from a January presentation to the council and it shows recent catch for both Gulf of Maine cod and haddock which has been well under the catch limit. So if you look at those green circles to the right of the table, you can see that the average catch from 2019 to 2021 for Gulf of Maine cod uh, has been 67.6% of the average sub ACL and for Gulf of Maine haddock just 17.2%. So there was no need to reactively adjust measures this year. Next slide. So next we look forward and we can do this for the two Gulf of Maine recreational stocks because there is a bioeconomic model that allows analysts to look at demand for recreational fishing trips with an age structured stock dynamics model. And from this, they can then provide advice to managers on what combination of possession limits, size limits and seasonal closures will constrain catch to annual limits. So basically there's two models that are combined a biological submodel and an economic submodel. I'm definitely not the one to explain this model in any depth, but there are numerous publications I can share that go into detail. And of course, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the GARPO staffer, Scott Steinbeck, who runs the model. Next slide. So what did the model have to say about this year? First, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the sub ACL for Gulf of Maine cod is staying the same at 192 metric tons for 2023, but it is going down drastically for Gulf of Maine haddock. And that's because of the phenomenal 2013 year class that's aging out, which we did expect a decline, but it is a bit faster and steeper than we anticipated, which is resulting in an 83% reduction to the 610 metric ton sub ACL for the 2023 fishing year. Now, if you look back up at the table that shows how status quo rules would perform if they were carried forward into the 2023 fishing year, the model estimates that basically all would be fine with status quo Gulf of Maine cod rules. You see this in the green highlighted circle where it shows that estimated mortality would be around 159 metric tons and that's under the 192 metric tons sub ACL. However, moving to the right, the red circle shows the problem with status quo Gulf of Maine haddock rules. And the estimated mortality would result in a 34 metric ton overage of the 610 sub ACL. But that's only part of the problem. If you continue, um, sorry, so the estimated mortality is represented by the median value of 100 simulations of the model. So if you go all the way to the right to the red box, this highlights the fact that very few of those simulations stay within the Gulf of Maine haddock catch limit. Generally, we want to see at least a 50% probability of not exceeding limits. And you know that's for stocks that are in a healthy condition, whereas Gulf of Maine haddock is now subject to overfishing. So based on this poor projected performance of status quo rules, the council proceeded with recommended rule changes. Next slide. And here's the summary table of the proposed rule changes just for the Gulf of Maine. Uh, stocks, and this table is also in the memo that Jared distributed to you. So for Gulf of Maine cod, the two-week spring fishery would be eliminated, but otherwise rules would remain the same as last year. For Gulf of Maine haddock, however, the season would remain the same, while the size limit would increase one inch to 18 inches, and the bag limit would be reduced to 15 fish. So that's it for the two Gulf of Maine stocks. Um, oh, sorry, next slide. There's one more thing. I just wanted to show you how this performs. So here you can see how those proposed rules perform much better in comparison to the status quo rules. So looking again at these green circles, you can see both the Gulf of Maine cod and haddock estimated median mortalities are well under the 2023 sub ACLs, or I should say well under, but they're under the sub ACLs. And moving to the right in those green highlighted boxes, you see the high probability of success of staying under the catch limits. So, the next stop, step for Gulf of Maine cod and haddock is for the agency GARFO to implement these rules as recommended. They've got to go through their own uh, rulemaking process. Next slide. So Georgia's bank cod, adjusting those measures is a bit more of a shot in the dark. There's no bioeconomic model to project catch estimates against the recreational catch target. And overall, uh, the uh, it appears
years around a 48% reduction in mortality is needed to stay within the 113 metric ton catch target that was established by the Council for Georgia's Bank Cause. So the two biggest dials to achieve that reduction appear to be consistent measures across all states and which months are closed to harvest. So looking first at state by state harvest in the table at the bottom, you can see that New York and New Jersey comprise over 60% of total mortality for Georgia's bank cod. Their current rules allow for more access to Georgia's bank cod than under current federal rules, which has resulted in pretty significant harvest in state waters, but also appears to be causing some enforcement issues in federal waters. If they were to retain their existing regulations, those two states' removals would approximate 135 metric tons, which on its own exceeds the 113 metric ton catch target for the 2023 fishing year. Now, up at the top table, even if all states adopted status quo federal rules, including New York and New Jersey, removals would only be reduced by about 28%, and that's well short of the needed 48% reduction. So like the Gulf of Maine, cod stock, or Gulf of Maine stocks, the council proceeded with recommended rule changes. Next slide. Now, in this case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the major dial ended up being the season, shifting the current May, June, July closed season to a June, July, August closed season. And this appears to achieve the necessary reduction as seen in the highlighted green bubble. But without a model and the inherent uncertainty of the recreational catch statistics in general, and for this stock in particular, the council also approved eliminating the slot limit in favor of a 23 in minimum size, and that would allow for greater certainty that we will not exceed the recreational catch target. Uh, I believe the proposed minimum size may achieve an additional 13% reduction in overall mortality. And I'll just note the slot limit, uh, you know, the feedback was pretty negative on that. So uh, doing away with the slot limit, which was just uh, implemented last year and implementing a 23 inch minimum size slide. Next slide. And this is the last one, Mr. Chair. So all that gets us back to why we're here, which is proposing to you emergency action to complement the rules recommended unanimously by the council and hopefully soon to be adopted by NIMS. So this is a recap of the rules for all three stocks. And uh, as you've heard uh, numerous times today in terms of our state process and timeline, should you agree, we plan to file emergency action. In this case, as soon as federal rules are finalized, then within the 90-day emergency rule period that uh, the director spoke about, we'll conduct public hearings and come back to you to adopt permanent state measures. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you much for your presentation, Melanie. Questions for Melanie, Kim Brady. Let's start with uh, commission members. Michael, if you have a question, you do sit on the council. so. I'd like to open this up to commission members other than council members. Tim Brady, have you any questions? Okay. Uh, I, I, I do not. I'm, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Let's just okay. open. Yeah, I just got a question looking at this uh, screen. Yeah, thank you. Looking at the screen, it's up. It's got Gulf of Maine Attic, May 1st to February 28th, and then April 1st to April 30th. What is what where's the month of March coming to all that? I'm just missing something, I guess. That that's a closed period. And I, I apologize that it has to be presented like that, but we do that just because okay. of the federal fishing year, you know, starting on May 1 and that the the rules change year to year, but March is uh closed. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Thank you, Suki. Questions for Melanie? Mike. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Melanie, has the last wave from 2022 come in? Uh, I heard there was a significantly lower catch recorded, especially in Georgia's bank cod. And has that been uh, considered? with these seasons and bag limits, because I believe there was assumptions made on a higher catch. And if such, would that change this? Uh, I, I don't know if you have the answer to that. That's, that's the first thing. Second thing, as you know, is, is that unfortunately, 
National Marine Fisheries Service drags their feet with implementation of these measures. And uh, is there anything we should do? Should this DMF send a letter uh, asking that they uh, expedite this so we don't have um, timing timelines here where the fishery is open that um, is gonna increase catch and then ultimately we're, we could have an issue with 2020 with this year for next year for setting quotas and bag limits and seasons. Thanks, Mike. So um, I'll, I'll tackle your timing question first. And we heard from NIM staff at the council that they were confident that we would not see delays like last year. Now, <laughs> those were pretty significant delays. I think it was August before we had rules. Um, so I'm not, you know, are we gonna maybe be de delayed a, a, a week or two or a month still, but they they seem pretty confident, at least confident enough to go on the record that we would not see that. Uh, I think it always helps to uh, give them feedback about how important this is, but they're, they're well aware of it. Uh, and then in terms of the estimated mortality for um, 2022, I have not seen revised numbers yet. It was projected. So when the council was discussing these measures, it was projected that the Georgia's bank cod removals would be 218 metric tons. Um, certainly if there are revisions, I think that will play into, uh, it's too late for the council really to do anything, right? We've provided our recommendations, but the federal process and as they're analyzing those rules, I'm sure it would come into play there. But I can follow up and, and take a look at the uh, most recent estimates and, and follow up with you. You good, Michael? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Melanie. Questions for Melanie? Not seeing any further hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation, Melanie your updates, and this too will be an emergency rulemaking on behalf of the director. Okay, so Raymond, um, uh, we next on the agenda is a um, presentation on the circle hook study. And um, I think we should anticipate that this meeting today might run over 20, 20 minutes to a half hour longer than what's on the agenda. Just wanna make sure everybody's aware of that. So um, Mike, Armstrong, I believe you're up to give a, a presentation on the circle hook study. Michael, you're recognized. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's see if I can get this going here. Hang on. Maybe Melanie should have shared her coffee with you at Cat Cove. Well, yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. Can you all see that now? Yes. Beautiful. All right, I added um, um, a little piece to this too, just looking at the striped bass harvest. So these are two issues that at least some of you are gonna hear from the public very soon and probably not in a good way. Um, so I wanted to get up in front of the curve and, and let you what was new, know what's going on. Um, so the first is, uh, I think you all know we've been doing a striped bass release mortality. This was in response partially because ASMC put circle hooks uh, as mandatory for use with live or cut bait. Um, we did that without a lot of good evidence that it works well. It has been studied, you know, for billfish, for groupers, for a lot of other species, and they work great. Um, very limited unpublished studies for striped bass. So we thought we'd do one, and I'm not going to go through the meth. I'll skip most of the methodology. I think you, you've heard it all and give you the uh, results, which were um, not expected. So anyway, I've told you about uh, all the all the uh, procedures we did, we acoustically tagged striped bass, um, and then we went fishing in Salem Sound. After we covered the entire sound with acoustic receivers, 
In addition, we have a whole lot of receivers up and down the East Coast. In fact, this doesn't even include Greg Scummel's about 100 uh, white shark receivers in Massachusetts waters. And they go all the way down to Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay and Hudson River. So if our fish live, we not just pick them up on our receivers, we pick them up on other researchers' receivers. And they, I'll take questions at the end. I'm just gonna blast through this. Um, so we use four, four different hooks, two, uh, sorry, three circle hooks, one J hook. Um, these appeared to be some of the more popular hooks that are used, three different sizes of circle hook. And we used uh, both live and dead herring maracla menhaden. So when we caught the bass, we also recorded a whole bunch of things with that. Um, bite time, temperature, handling time, and, and all those that we thought in other studies we've done on other species turned out to be important. Um, one of the more important things is we assigned a uh, condition score based on just gross uh, looking at how they're hooked and is there bleeding and where they're hooked. So I, I won't go through all these. One is, you know, lip hook, it's not bleeding, the hook comes out easy. Uh, down to uh, you're, you're putting a fish, a fish back that's, uh, for all intents and purposes, almost dead. Uh, so I'll get to the crux of it very quickly. Um, we did not find a difference between circle hooks and J hooks. That was very surprising because every other study has shown that. Um, so here's the important thing I want to say is that doesn't mean circle hooks don't work. It means the manner we fished and the hooks we used, um, there was no difference between circle and J. So we're now going to extend the studies uh, and we want to look at various morphologies, um, thicker shanks, shorter shanks, um, what have you, different different gap sizes. And so we use octopus circles and, you know, I don't use them and I, I use just regular uh, circles and I have, you know, a lot of success in catching them by the lip. Um, so mm -hmm. this has slowly been leaking out and we haven't published yet. We're writing it up, so it's not peer reviewed. So I wanna have, add a lot of caveats to it but we are giving presentations because people are begging for the information. Um, but at this point, I want to give the caveat, we are not prepared to say circle hooks don't work. Um, they are equivalent to J hooks in the, in the manner in which we fish them and the, and the samples that we used. So that's really important because I fear we've already heard it from the public based on a couple of presentations where even where we gave all these caveats, the message is coming out, circle hooks don't work. So that is not the message, but there's more to the story. Um, and that's just the four different ones we, we tested. So no difference between any of them. All right, um, there's some other interesting stuff I'll, I'll just, touch on very quickly. So it wasn't just about circle versus J, it was about post-release mortality also. And so if you look at what we call it's a fairly subjective measure of condition, it did match up to, to what we predicted. So condition of one, which is lip hooked and not bleeding and swims off, uh, probability of mortality was 2% and so forth. So fours, they're bloody, they're barely moving. That's 100% mortality. Um, the, this, this score here, they might be hooked on the gill. There's a little bit of bleeding. Mortality is very high. Um, so that'll come into play with a study I'm, I'm gonna tell you next. But there's a lot of other information we got so if we look at hook location, uh, unhooking time and water temperature. So here we have mortality probability. 
these are each one of these curves is a hook location. And here's un, uh, unhook time. So clearly on all of them, the longer it takes you to unhook your fish, mortality goes up. And that probably also applies to how long you keep it in the boat. And that'll be part of an, another study. Um, but if it's hooked in the mouth, mortality is going to stay pretty low um, and so forth. If it's hooked in the gill it, and, and you get that thing overboard very quickly, which generally means it unhooked easily so you didn't rip out a bunch of pieces of gill, um, it's still 55% more. Mortality. And the longer you keep it there, the, the higher it goes. So water temperature is really important. Now we didn't have much of a range because you know we did the study up here in Salem Sound. So we got some temperatures of 10 degrees uh, all the way up to 22. And so this, this cluster of points at the top shows the sample size. Um, so most of our data was in a, a fairly shallow range, but we still got quite a bit of difference. Um, doesn't, temperature doesn't make too much of the fish is essentially uninjured, um, but all the rest of them, you go up a few degrees and it really makes a big difference. So we don't, there's not a lot of opportunity to look at different temperatures up here, but think of Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're probably at 25 to 30 degrees in the summer. So project this out, which you're not supposed to do statistically, but you do that and those numbers really go up high. So Chesapeake Bay, we use 9% mortality. It's probably much, much higher. And so we're working with uh, folks around Chesapeake Bay to try to do a, a similar study. Um, because you know things like that are adding inaccuracies to the uh, stock assessment when we assign just nine percent. So anyway, that was a good finding. And then you look at it a different way, looking at combining unhooking time and water temperature. So going from left to right, these boxes are where it was hooked, and the x-axis is the uh, unhooked time and the y-axis temperature. So if it's hooked in the mouth, you, you can see we go from 0% green, 100% mortality red. If it's in the mouth, it's healthy and it can withstand a lot of things, even being kept out of the water. And so you can see as they all go up in a diagonal, so the longer book time combined with water temperature, you get into a very uh, a dangerous spot for the fish in uh, a number of the different scenarios. Uh, so we're continuing to analyze these things too. So we will be, it'll be coming out as a publication. We'll be submitted, uh, submitting it in the next month or two. So in spite of not finding a difference between J hooks and circle hooks, we found out an awful lot of information. So what we're gonna do is we're going to start a citizen science program um, probably in, in May when the fish show up here and we're recruiting 300 anglers and we'd be happy to have you folks on board if you want. We're going to give them a, a kit with a measuring device, um, some pliers um, and a timer. And they will record a variety of information, the key parts being unhooking time and fight time water temperature and hook location. And we'll have them take a picture of the actual hook they're using. And we're not restricting it to certain kind of hooks. We're also gonna have artificials, um, anything they're fishing with, they can document. So we will then have a wealth of information about other um, gear types. And we, can, we now have a model that just based on condition factor, which will be estimated by the fishermen, we can estimate, and including water temperature and, and hook location, we can predict the death rate. So we don't have to acoustically tag a bunch of fish again, because we have a model to predict it. Um, we're actually gonna try and 
uh, recruit some folks down in Chesapeake Bay to help us out too. So probably 300 this year, but we're ready to go. If we get a big response, um, we'll give it to more people. So anyway, I'm gonna move on and, and you guys can ask questions at the end if you want, but uh, many of you folks have heard, we've got a little problem with striped bass again. So the assessment, we, we've done an assessment and we're in very good shape and they did a projection of the population. Um, and this assumed that F would stay the same. So we have to recover the SSB by 2029, according to the plan. And last meeting, everything was on target. The problem is uh, harvest removals double last year in 22, doubled from 2021. Everyone was sort of dumbfounded by that. Uh, the problem is the previous SSB projections assumed F would stay the same. Um, that projection showed that there was a 74% chance of reaching the SSB target. That's a, that's a really good chance of hitting it. Keep in mind, and people don't understand this quite completely, 50% is the point estimate. That's really what you target. Uh, it could be lower, it could be higher. Um, so 74 means that's a really good chance and everyone was really pleased. And then we looked at the data from 22. So we appear to have violated the assumption that F stayed the same. Um, here's a look at us. So I should have flipped these, um, but anyway, here's 21, 22. So we went up, um, so this is, this is all the catch release and harvested. This is released live and this is total harvest. Uh, so the most important one is this column. Let's look at that. Our harvest went up 174%. New Hampshire went up 401%. Uh, Connecticut, 453%. Delaware, for whatever reason, went down. So everyone went up. The big players went up. New York, one of the biggest players with us, uh, they're up 520%. And so overall landings along the coast were up 91%. That's double what it was in 2021. Um, why is that? It's because the primarily, I don't know if effort is increasing as we're coming out of the uh, COVID, um, but what we do know is the 2015 year class, which is very large, and it's the only large one out there, was in the slot last year, the 28 to 34 slot. So they're, uh, they were seven years old last year. They're at the beginning of the slot. This year, they're going to be in it again as eight-year-olds. Um, so our anticipation is landings might be high again. And then uh, I just looked at... Uh, mode and wave just for your edification. Um, big increases in the private rental, less so in charter. Uh, party really actually is inconsequential, but it's pulled out and shore was up a lot. And there was an awful lot cut somewhere in March and April. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where that is, I haven't pulled it out. But July and August saw a big increase. So it wasn't this, we were all worried about November, December, and when they all come past Jersey and they have a really big fishery. It increased, but it, it, that wasn't the big deal. It was kind of coastwide um, where the increase was. So what does this mean? Besides being rising and a real turn on things, because we were resting on our laurels and patting ourselves on the back for being really great managers. So Gary Nelson who works for us, 20 feet from me is currently running the projections again, using new assumptions of higher landings. It is likely that F has increased, thus rendering SSB projections inaccurate. It is likely the probability of hitting the SSB target by 2029 has decreased. And the question is, what should the management response be if the probability is less than 50%? And that's just something to think about. 
um, yeah, I, <laughs> I think it's a bad thing to be chasing our tail around and changing rules every year. I wish we hadn't opened up this can of worms. Keep in mind, fisheries populations do not collapse overnight. You don't have to chase F around every single year, um, but there will be a huge public outcry if this projection comes out with a much lower uh, probability of hitting the target in 2029. Because boy, we thought we were there. And I think uh, I'll leave it at that. So any questions on our release mortality or this, uh, this new information coming out about striped bass? Questions from commission members from Mike Armstrong, Dr. Michael. Yeah. Leo. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, Michael, uh, it's, it's really disturbing. And uh, where, where, where was the mistake made? Where was the mistake made in, in, in not having, having the data? And I need to say that it seems like uh, anecdotally with everyone I'm talking about, people on the Cape, on the Monum Way, rips here and there uh, they're catching the biggest fish they've ever caught uh, consistently what happens when the 15-year class withers out eventually as time goes on and we have poor recruitment coming up the line somewhere along the line we some tough decisions are going to have to be made and, and and i want to get back to is there a possibility that we might have to have just as we have for the black sea bass some emergency rules being made and people aren't going to like it but somewhere that somewhere along the line we're going to have to start i feel from my unscientific unscientific way of thinking we're going to have to do something drastic to to preserve these fish i mean i i it, you know we three years in a row of a, a bad recruitment. What happens when we get the fourth year? Hopefully we don't, but what happens when we get the fourth year or fifth year? Somewhere along the line, some tough decisions are gonna have to be made and people are gonna have to like it uh, if we're gonna preserve the species. Okay, that's that's a lot to respond to, but I'll, I'll start with, there were, there were no mistakes made. The, the data are the data. That's what was used. Um, it's, you can't predict participation. You can't predict that there's huge schools of menhaden with big fish underneath them. Uh, I mean, the availability last year was crazy. Um, what you probably could do some sort of modeling, but it's very sophisticated and inaccurate is try to look at increased catch rates because there's a strong year class. The, the uh, TC actually looked at it when we were, we were looking at the um, the plan last year, and they did not see an advantage to try and move the slot around to protect the year class. In retrospect, in retrospect, maybe I don't know. Um, maybe we should have. Projections are projections; they are not reality. They have as much reality as we can. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it with: there were no mistakes made. The harvest went up. Now we have to deal with it. So are we gonna have to cut F, which, you know, what are we gonna do to do that? Uh, a smaller slot? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but it, the second part to your question is we have four, that's, that's in the short term. We can get back to SSB with the right F, the, the target SSB. But then for uh, four bad year classes, the last four years start hitting the SSB, and all bets are off. Um, the SSB will go down and it'll be a difficult uh, time. It, it will be difficult trying to stop the decline. I have heard anecdotally that the conditions for spawning this year weren't particularly optimistic. So if we get a fifth year of uh, bad recruitment, uh, we're in serious trouble. Um, I don't know. I don't know what we're, you know, <laughs> it'll be a, an extremely low F that we will need to maintain SSB. If, if so, what we're, what, so what we're doing, we're, we're, we're gambling on 
a, a, a fifth good year and, and maybe gambling on a sixth good year. And we keep seeming to, well, this is, this is my thinking. We seem to be always gambling on the, the next year. Uh, when, when, when do we, when do we finally say we've got to really, and, and, you know, the sign, I go with the science. I, I, I always say that, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a have a, I have a science background and I have to say, well, I like to go with the science, but sometimes we got, we have to go with an intuitive feeling that things aren't good. And just like, just like we, we didn't anticipate what's happening right now. The, 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 uh, the, the 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 f being down and if we get below 50 percent and, and and everybody was saying everybody was patting themselves in the back well you're at 29 we're gonna it's going to be rebuilt by 29 and then we have the the rug pulled out from under us and saying well we, we maybe we have a problem and 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 i well, i'm just think somewhere along the line we have a fisher cut bait and 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 deal with the situation as far as striped bass are concerned i mean i'm just i'm really upset about hearing this and and um and i just hope that we can turn this turn this fishery around yeah i I'm, mean i'm venting i'm venting now and you have to yeah, that's all right and you know there's no there's no real blame here um we have as much ssb as created some of the biggest year classes ever so the potential is there it's mother nature is not cooperating have we entered a low productivity regime and could it be permanent because of climate change they're having yeah. droughts they're having floods they're having strange temperatures um now the bright spot is hudson river a portion of our fish come from there it depends on when and where up to 50 percent um sometimes comes from the hudson river so that's going to help us sustain things a fishery but you're right, Cleo. Things things could get really bad. Which is, I'm sitting here staring at my retirement chart, and I will be uh, figuring out when I have to leave before those bad year classes hit, and then Nick can take over. You know, and and you and I don't want to I don't want to belabor and drag out the meeting uh, because climate is probably the major factor in this, and this, especially with the the newest report that came out with the international. I can't give you the name of the, the commission that, that gave that the report was uh, published today, as far as the amount of carbon that we have, that we're, we're getting to the tipping point, and I, I can't help but feel that it's a, it's not only a combination of population. We do have a population of striped bass, but it's it's what's happening to their breeding grounds uh, with the siltation, the warm water, the pollution. Um, it just seems to be a mess, but and there seems to be no urgency in my mind that we that this species needs to be conserved. And, and I, you know, I think the public has a right to be upset um, because we, we were we had we had such a great recovery and rebound of this species, and all of a sudden it seems it's going in the other direction. And and I'm venting, and I apologize, but it's it's it really is disturbing news. Yeah, I mean, the two main problems are uh, we're at one fish in a small slot. I mean, what else can we do? Uh, keep reducing the slot. Um, there's just too many people enjoying striped bass fishing. And, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but that's the bottom line is we're having a real difficult time controlling F because of participation. And that won't go away, but this looming four years of bad year classes is is a coming, and we're, we're concentrated on trying to hit 2029 20, SSB, but behind the scenes of these four year classes. So they won't particularly be part of the SSB by 2029. They'll, they'll just be getting into it. Um, so SSB will decline unless well, it's... Well, incredibly thing, low F. Yeah, the last thing, I, last thing I'll say is that you know the striped bass, it is the flagship of ASMFC. It was stated publicly in writing that that's what it is, and uh, it would be a shame that uh, if uh, this this fish, this species, um, went into a demise that it, it couldn't come back from. 
no argument there. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, may I suggest something? This is a recreational fishery, and Khalil, maybe it's time that the recreational people come up with resolution as opposed to looking the management and wanting to point fingers. I think you look at it rationally. You bring a lot of ideas to the plate, but I think overall the recreational fishery has to take responsibility and suggest things to ma the management board at ASMFC because one state wants one thing, another state wants another. I don't know, but this is a recreational fishery and you're right, it is to ASMFC what codfish was to the state of Massachusetts at one time. Questions for Michael? Not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. So are we good, Michael? Now that you've presented us with this shocking yep. news. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to finish the meeting with some good news. All set. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mike Piernock, you recognize. Yeah, I'm sorry, my hand was up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can't, can't get away yet, Mike. Uh, I hope all is well, and I thank you for your presentation. Um, it's, it's some good stuff. Uh, it, in a sense, it uh, validates all the multiple other uh, studies that have been done. Well, not all, but many of them that have come up with similar findings. Uh, I do have a question about your the live bait. Did you bridle the hooks? Did you hook them through the eyes? Did you hook them in the dorsal fin? I'm just curious of what approach was taken to that. That's the first thing. Next thing, if uh, I'd be great if you could forward a copy, me a copy of the presentation and with the citizen science, I, I will do all I can to get the word out for participation. Hopefully, that's a nice first step to see that. It's very similar at the climate summit with what was being discussed to, to try to get uh, participation in cooperative research and citizen science to help the, the data set of what's really going on. So that's a, that's a great uh, first step. Um, and then while you, if you could just answer those questions, I'll just have a quick question about the MREP modes uh, with that summary, if that could be thrown up there, thanks. Sure. Uh, let's see. I think the first question was no. We didn't. We didn't bridle them. We either put it through their snout or through their eyes. We let the angler decide. On that. And uh, all right, I have to reshare. I mean, one one observation me and others have had is, and actually, it's it's the experience of the angler that dictates how the post-release mortality will work, or whether you get them in the lip and whether you get them in, in, in the gut. In addition to circle hooks were designed by the, the native peoples going after pelagics in the Pacific, where they made circle hooks out of bones so that when they quickly catch them, they'd be able to release them. And a pelagic gets that fish, gets that hook, takes off and gets them nicely hooked in the jaw. One of the problems with straight bass, they don't necessarily uh, have behavior that re reflects that. We, we, we call them dogs because they're down in the bottom eating like dogs and you know eating and spitting it out and inhaling and so on. But when they do take it and run with it, then that's when you have a nice effective uh, hook uh, in the lip with a release. So your 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 data and information there is uh, good, and uh, as always, it's tough to uh, apply conclusions to everything because of the different variables with experience and who's a, you know catching the fish and what your type's being used and whether it's light tackle or heavy tackle or so on. So I thank you for that. Now the MREP note, is, is this MREP data, is this for Massachusetts? Uh, oh, good question. This is coastwide. I would be interested in Massachusetts, but th this this is something that 
as I have to sit at the table uh, at the council level or, or, or even at this level, when you have a fishery and there's great fishing, and I'll use TOG as an example, that seemed to have explode, exploded and the recreational community now wants to go after TOG, which in the older days, that wasn't the case. Then you have a problem, recreational effort goes up, mortality goes up. How do you manage that? I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but you see it there, coast wide. I'd be curious to what, what the difference is in, in Massachusetts. You know, um, when our fish are arriving up here and does this really adequately reflect what's going on up here? In addition, gotcha. your other summary, believe me, Mr. Chairman, I am at the meetings more than often than not indicating climatic shifts, shifting stocks, and, and we're the recipient up in here in New England, which the, a lot of the other councils are not. So they, they don't have the same experience we have with them coming up here. So you, you have the haves and the have nots. But when you look at that distribution of how increased catch in New Hampshire and Maine, well, the temperature went up, the, 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 excuse me, the temperature was such, the bait was such, last year there was a tremendous amount of bait near shore with temperatures that resulted in unbelievable catch. So there's a shift too with that. People up in Maine, you're, you're getting schoolies. Last year, they were getting nice sized fish, 30, 40 inches. So things are changing. They continue to, and we have it in a, a somewhat of a, a subcategory of that here just within Massachusetts that from Boston Harbor on north, the water's cooler and the fish are up that way and moving farther north. And that's what we see. Then a question with this is, is this just recreational catch or does that include recreational and commercial? It's just rec uh, recreational. Uh, thank you. No, well yeah. done, Mike. Uh, yeah, there's some issues ahead. Uh, I, I know this isn't a meeting about recommendations of how to address it, uh, but maybe it's time that we change our management to also assess what's in the EEZ and what's going on with that stock. And as our forage fish are near shore or offshore and how striped bass and multiple other species follow that forage fish, where last year our forage fish were near shore and the stripers were right behind them and they stayed here almost the entire season. And ultimately then the catch and, and mortality went way up. Now, thank you, Mike. Yeah, yeah you. just one quick point that, that you brought up, I forgot to say, um, our schoolie, our, our gross landings, the total catch is driven by schoolies. And because of those poor year classes um, that are entering our fishery at, at age three and four, um, you're actually seeing a decrease in the catch in a lot of the states um, while the harvest is going up tremendously because of those slot fish from the 2015 year class. So we have two different things going on. Um, so you're right, the fishing was really good for big fish and the response is non-linear. When fishing gets good, um, the response of anglers is to increase the number of trips and the number of participants not in a linear fashion, but in a non-linear fashion where the, you double the amount of fish and you quadruple the number of participants, something like that. So uh, it, it, when the fishing could, it makes things worse. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, Michael, it's uh, Raymond. Uh, last year, I, I, I thought I brought this to your attention, speaking to anglers in New Hampshire and Maine, we had an eddy of colder water that just held along the shoreline for quite quite a while. So I, I think a temperature variance should be brought into this. Uh, maybe Gary can do something with that, you know, looking at temperatures from prior years, because last year an abundance of large fish were caught and everything was set up for them. They had the Menhaden, they had the, the cooler water last year. I, I believe it finally broke up the middle of August along the Maine, New Hampshire. And that was my thought when I heard about all these large fish being landed by recreational fishermen, which, which they hadn't seen in years. 
I believe water temperature had a lot to do with it, along with the menhaden, you know, the inshore bait forage. But anyways, that was a thought I mentioned to you last year. I don't know if anybody thought about it or looked at that. You know, you could look at it in a historical perspective. What was the the mean temperature last year as opposed to previous years in those same months? Thank yeah, you. we. I mean, we haven't looked at it. There's there's really a, um, a demand to look at covariant factors with MRIP to make it cleaner data and explain it. Um, increases in effort by different things like water temperature, but it's really complicated and it hasn't been done yet. Thank you, Michael. Questions for Dr. Armstrong? Mike Pierdnock? Michael, you're recognized. I'm sorry, I'm hands down, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Questions for Dr. Armstrong? Nothing else I see in the queue, Mr. Chair. You're not seeing anyone in the queue? Nope. Okay, thank you, Dr. Armstrong, for the bad news. It's one way to end the, what I thought was a very positive meeting, but Striper is what it is. And we have to be informed and kept up to date. Thank you very much, Mike. Moving on to other business, uh, we'll start with uh, commission member comments. I'll go around the table. Tim Brady. Uh, thanks. Appreciate uh, everybody's work. Um, had a busy winter, um, but uh, good to be back on council business and um, appreciate all the work that's gone into uh, that all the, all the work that goes on month to month from the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Bill Doyle. I'm all set, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bill Amaru. <laughs> all set. Excuse me, my moment in the sun. I'm coughing. Yeah, uh, happy, happy uh, vernal equinox, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Khalil? Yes, the only thing I'd like to say is that um, I appreciated everything that went on today and how we conducted ourselves with uh, dealing with uh, Director McKiernan's request for the emergency uh, rulemaking. And um, even though we ended up on a on a negative note with the uh, striped bass, uh, it just goes to show just how complicated uh, marine fisheries uh, can be, and that it, it's there are no easy answers. Uh, sometimes we have to do what's right for the for the species. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for for everything you do at the marine fisheries. That's a great organization. And I know that the um, the, the the hearts are in in it for the not only for the for the fisheries but also for the folks who are involved with the fisheries. So thanks and um, have a great day. Thank you, Khalil Suki. Yeah, it's nothing nothing special, Ray. Thanks. So I guess we'll see you all on Friday. Yeah, that's right. I want to talk to Dan about something, so I'll wait on the weekend. Okay, thank you, Suki. Michael Pierdnock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Only one more thing to add. Uh, there's upcoming uh, public sessions concerning uh, highly migratory species, bluefin, tuna, commercial, recreational uh, RFDs, restricted fishing days. Uh, the, they're, they're upcoming with comments due um, in early April. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that that's uh, out there. Thank you. Yeah, and to add to that, I'm going to be giving a Woman, your contact information, being how you're still on the HMSAP. Okay, thank you, Michael. Lou Williams. Uh, I guess I'm all set, right? Thank you, Lou. Shelly Edmondson. No comments, but thanks, Ray. Thank you, Shelly. And once again, I would like to thank the entire, all the commission members for their attendance records. They're energized and they add a lot. So thank you once again. I'm gonna open this up to public comment. Jared, anybody in the public have a hand raised? Jared. 
Barrett. Yes, good afternoon. Um, it was a very good meeting. I listened in on that. Um, I have a couple of points I, I need to bring up. Uh, we've yeah, spent the last 10 years. Can you, can you please to... identify yourself? Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. So it's Eric Morrow, Bounty Hunter. Bounty Hunter fishing. If you go through those emails, the 62 emails, yeah. I'm referenced a lot of times in the comments from the public as far as the separate mode for the sea bass. I have a couple of comments. Um, we used to have public meetings, the public face to face pre COVID. Now we have Zoom, people are behind the keyboard. Um, it, it, I understand that, but I have, it's a hard pill to swallow that 0.3% of the saltwater anglers in Massachusetts, their opinion is going to dictate what happens. People that write a letter took time, typed it out sent it in. People that logged in to the Zoom meeting that we had on March 13th, took time out of their day, had an interest in it. Um, I emailed the company wired. I want to see how the survey was done. I want to see if there's IP address accountability to be sure that that was 864 different people. Not one household with somebody with an agenda send it in 20 different surveys. Because the people that took the time to write the letters, the people that took the time to be on the Zoom meeting, the results go totally to a separate for a higher mode. So that's my first point. Number two, Rhode Island and Connecticut, our neighboring states, do and have had separate for higher regulations for the Black Sea Bass for multiple years. Number three, I just got back from the Edison Sport Fishing Show in New Jersey, one of the biggest shows in the Northeast. I flew up from, as you do know, I work year round now trying to work with these regulations. I have a charter boat down here in the Keys just trying to pay the bills. Got up there for the last three days, spoke to hundreds of customers. Everybody's concerned about the codfish and the sea bass and the scum. They're like, Cap, I'm going to hours now for 40 sea bass uh 40 scup and four sea bass and then your cox's trips and your your trips you run out of cape they're going to disappear during the summer i said yes hard pill to swallow what do they do they walk down to the island current or the sound bound the local city island boats they'll fish locally that affects the hotels the gas stations the restaurants everybody else i support as far as the and going back again i am the bus that takes the kayak angler out. I am the bus that takes the recreational angler with the 16 foot ball in the fall or during the not so much nice days. I'm the guy who takes the shore angler out. So I, that's, I'm the mode of transportation to the fish. The fish are in deeper water, they're further, they're at moments with the warm waters. The average guy can't reach them. I also find that the 16 and a half inch the general public that was on the survey, they're uneducated. They don't understand fisheries. They don't understand MREP data. I do. We all do on this meeting. I find it very difficult that the, the 16 and a half inch increase, that we're not going to have an increase in dead discards. I, it's going to be a nightmare. We're going to be talking about two fish next year. It's do that size increase. And the guy in his kayak talks to an intercept and says, oh, I threw back 300 sea bass today. I only got two keepers. We all know how that math's going to turn out. It's going to be ugly. You think the striped bass is going to be ugly, what we just heard in the last 10 minutes? The 16 and a half inches is going to be a, a complete nightmare. Um, give me one more second. I, I know I'm holding everybody up, but I had a couple of notes, and this is very important here. Um, so where'd it go here? And I just, I just want to put everybody in the shoes of a far higher person. I know we have a diverse, the, the board is made of people of many different backgrounds. Um, you know, I was a merchant Marine. I, I, you know, I went to the maritime. I had a job I can make in 200 grand right now with full benefits. I choose what I do because it's my passion. So if you're a far higher guy, for me, for instance, it costs about $80,000 just to get going now for the season. Yard bills, paying crew to get boats, insurance, slips, everything. We depend on the deposits to come in to get the year going. That's how it goes. I just went to a show 
and my bookings were down by approximately 80% this weekend. The people want no interest in it anymore. It, 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 we have to be able to sell the product. Sometimes if it wasn't for COVID and the Zoom, I guarantee you I'd be sitting there with Keith Baker by my side and right on that back wall, right over it, just because I was at every meeting for years, driving to every one of these. Um, if I, it's going to start back here. Um, I know we're talking about this, looking at it for next year. I need something to sell. I really need something to sell. The Fahari fleet was not being greedy in any of those options because we're status quo. But we need that first stepping stone to be recognized as a separate mode moving forward. And if you do that, especially option six, the state will get the data it needs for that fall fishery because they've been asking for years. So the recreational guy can go out and you'll have that data. And moving forward, it's going to be beneficial to everyone. Um, in closing, I'm just double checking my notes here. So once again, in closing, I, I don't have much faith in that survey. That 0.3% of the licensed saltwater anglers in the state of Massachusetts is going to dictate the way we're going. In addition, the for higher fishery in Massachusetts, specifically scup and sea bass, approximately 80% of our clients done multiple I put uh, together years ago about that, how much money they spend in the state. That 80% of our clients were not even exposed to have an opinion in this, yet they're supporting the economy. So it just seems like it's very, um, I don't know the proper word for it. It doesn't seem like it was a straight way to do it because those, all these clients that are supporting this fishery and supporting the hotels and supporting the, uh, the local economy didn't even have an opinion to voice in. I sent an email out the day before. I didn't tell my customers to even put Bounty Hunter on it. I just gave my heads up that there's something coming up, voice your opinion. And they did. And as you can see, out of that 60 something, you probably got 30 of them from my, some of my guys. And I only did before the last minute uh, decision. Um, like I said, I just, Dan, I know you got to make a decision. Everybody's supposed to agree. And, and it has to be ruled into law in four months. But I'm going to be doing my homework here. I'm going to find out about this survey. I'm going to find out about the IP addresses. And I am going to reach out to my local politicians. Because just because one guy knew some politician and some governor or senator wrote a letter, this is my livelihood. I'm I'm ready to get dirty and uh, I'm gonna get you know get the public Eric, behind Eric, you. Eric, 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 you're going on a long time here. Um, do you agree Sorry, that not, ninety? Do you agree that ninety percent of the anglers are on private vessels and not on charter boats and party boats? Eric, do I agree that ninety percent of the anglers are on private vessels? Yeah. And the black sea bass fishery, I go days without seeing, maybe seeing sure. three so, boats but, out but there. My, my, what, I wanna, I, what I want to say to you is when we have the public hearings and when the vast majority of the, the folks speaking are charter boat operators, it's really hard to, mm -hmm. um, to, to try to understand the needs of private anglers. I think we get our, did our best. Uh, maybe it can be improved. We'll certainly look at that. But um there's a whole bunch of, of anglers that, that don't, for whatever reason, don't represent their own interests at our normal public hearings. And we appreciate your input. We appreciate what you have to say. But I'll be honest with you, some of the things you've said here, um, your voice is dropping out because of the connection. So I would welcome you to put um, a lot of these comments in, in writing to, the, to, the, to me and we'll make sure we get it to the full board because I think the, uh, on behalf of the chairman, I think we do have other people who want to speak. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I wasn't sure how it was coming across. I'll, I'll put this all in a letter. It's just it's going to be after the fact because you guys are going to vote on this. But, you know, I just wanted to uh, express my uh, on that. Yeah. All right, Dan, we I appreciate, I appreciate that. The okay. time. Not, Thank you. Yep. I'll hold you all up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Next person, Jared. I'm not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, you're not seeing any. Hold on, we got Phil Coates. Phil, you recognize. Thank Phil. you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, I'm, this will be very quick. I just wanted to give you a little 
history lesson. Some of you might remember. Back in the day, I went to Boston in 71. We could implement, we could receive a petition, go through the process and implement a regulation in less than 60 days. And I know that's changed process, layers of process. I just hope to God we don't get a repeat of Larry, Moe, and Curley. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Jared, any other hands? No further comments from the, from the public, Mr. Chair. No further public comments. Then I'm going to call for a motion to adjourn. Somebody? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Suki. I need a second. Tim Brady, second. Is anybody in opposition to adjourning? Not seeing any opposition, Mr. Chair. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>